morning. 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 Good morning. Morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Julie. Good morning. We we have a quorum. It is now nine oh one. Uh, so whenever you want to start, I think we're ready to go. Okay. I'd like to welcome everyone to the March twenty fourth, two thousand twenty two landmarks meeting. In compliance with notification requirements of Ohio Open Meeting Law in Section one zero one point zero two one of the codified ordinance of Cleveland, Ohio, 1976, notice of this meeting has been publicly posted. All boards and commissions under the purview of the city planning department conduct its meetings according to Robert's rule of order. Actions during the meeting will be taken by voice vote. Abstentions from the vote due to a conflict of interest should be stated for the record prior to taking of any vote. In order to ensure that everyone participating in the meeting has the opportunity to be heard, we ask that you use the raised hand feature before you asking a question or making a comment. The raised hand feature can be uh, found in the participants panel on the desktop and mobile versions and activated by clicking the hand icon. Please wait for the chair or facilitator to recognize you and be sure to select unmute and announce yourself before you speak. When finished speaking, please lower your hand by clicking the raised hand icon again and muting your microphone. We'll be utilizing the chat feature to communicate with participants. The chat feature can be activated by clicking the chat button located at the bottom of the WebEx screen. Call-in users can unmute by using star six. All meeting activities are being recorded via the WebEx platform. These proceedings are also being live streamed via YouTube. All requests to speak on a particular matter via our website and email have been considered. Uh, we have also received emails from those who provided written comments on a particular matter and have uh, circulated to the commission. We'd like to call the March 24th, 2022 Landmarks Commission meeting to order. Mr. Pettit, please call roll. Ms. Anderson. Here. Mr. Bonazzi. Mr. Kalikia. Mr. Dreyer. Here. Mr. Edmund. Here. Director Wong. Mr. Strickland. Here. Mr. Tarasic. Here. Ms. Trot. Here. We are also joined today by uh, Carl Brunges, who is our host for the meeting, and also Kevin Roberts from the Department of Law. Madam Chair, we have a quorum. Excellent. We'll begin with our certificates of appropriateness. A little housekeeping before we start. Um, the facilitator is uh, controlling your slides, so please tell them when you'd like to advance. If you'd like to call the first applicant uh, forward, please uh, unmute your mic, state your name, and you can tell us about your project. The first applicant is the Jesse Owens Olympic Park. Thank you, Chairwoman Trot, and good morning, members of the commission. I am joined today uh, by both Jamie Schwartzberg from DRU Landscape Architecture, our landscape architect on this project, and Angelica Pozo, our artist. Um, my name is Alicia Blonsky. I'm the Vice President of Community Development at University Circle Incorporated. And um, I want to provide, if uh, Carl, you could go to the next slide. Just a brief background on the project. I think there may be some members of commission that weren't here when this went through for initial conceptual approval. Um, I'll turn it over to Jamie to talk through some of the um, landscape design changes made in response to some of the commission comments. And then finally over to uh, Angelica to walk through the final concepts for the public art plan. You can go to the next, plan, uh, next slide, Carl. 
Um, a bit of background about this Jesse Owens Olympic oak tree. When Jesse Owens won his four gold medals at the 1936 Olympics in Berlin, Germany, he was gifted four oak trees. Um, and the only one of those oak trees still living and confirmed to be uh, alive is at James uh, is at Rhodes High School in Cleveland, but it's nearing the end of its natural life. So, in a process and partnership between the Cleveland Metropolitan School District, Old Brooklyn CDC, and Holden Forest and Gardens, um, a piece of that tree was grafted and merged with an oak of the same species, essentially cloning that tree to create these new tree types of Jesse Owens Olympic oak trees. And the first one of those trees was planted in Rockefeller Park, just north of the Rockefeller Park Lagoon, uh, last April on Arbor Day. If you go to the next slide, Carl. Um, really, since the time that we knew that the tree was coming to this space, we started to do some conceptual landscape planning to um, determine, you know, the best location for the tree, how we could improve the area around it to bring people to the tree and also to share this amazing story of both the tree and the legacy of Jesse Owens. Um, we've been doing a lot of community engagement, including um, at hike shops and through um, activations at family fishing days that are at the lagoon. Um, to develop this plan that we've created. We also have uh, intentionally, and Angelica will go through this in more detail, a piece of the um, public art that will literally incorporate the words from the public in this piece in response to two quotes from Jesse Owens, one speaking to the importance of working hard towards dreams and one speaking to um, you know, the difficulties we all face um, in fighting our invisible battles every day. So we have prompts out to the community right now asking what are your dreams and what are your invisible battles? And Angelica will, will be um, incorporating the words we hear back from the community into this public art piece on one of the um, seating components. So um, we were grateful to receive conceptual approval from Landmarks Commission in January um, and have continued to work through finalizing the design. We uh, bid the project in February. We had hoped that we had all of the funding we needed to move forward with the base proposal. We are very close and awaiting some final confirmation of funds, and we still hope to be able to move forward with the project um, this spring. Um, and uh, with your approval for this final design. So unless there are any questions about the project background, maybe I'll pause there for a moment just before turning it over to uh, Jamie. I think that was a great summary. Um, feel free to move on. Okay, great. Uh, Jamie, could you uh, take it from here? Sure. Um, this is the tree planted on the rise overlooking the lagoon, looking back south towards the University Circle. You can go to the next slide. Uh, a overview map of the location where the tree is planted, just to give you guys an idea. Um, in proximity to the tennis courts, the Harrison Dillard Bikeway. Harrison Dillard was another Olympian from uh, Cleveland, another African American Olympian, and the lagoon and the playground, but an area that currently doesn't have any other uh, program associated with it. Um, next slide. This is the plan for the uh, memorial. You can see the tree in the center uh, as it's planted. And uh, we're proposing uh, an accessible walk that gets you up to uh, a little loop walk around the tree that would represent the kind of full canopy someday. So you can kind of see that ghosted in and that. Um, you know, that's maybe not in our lifetimes, but it sort of speaks to the scale and significance of the tree. Um, the loop around the uh, rise is almost exactly 200 meters, which is the longest race that Jesse won a medal for. Um, so we're uh, proposing to delineate that with a, um, a trail that's the width of an Olympic track lane. Um, and then there's four markers located around the loop. And we'll share with you the image of the, what the markers look like. Um, and then at the top, there's a bench, a long bench that represents the podium that Jesse stood on. And um, the wing of each side of the bench is the length of the long jump, which is the one of the other medals that he won. And there's also uh, sort of more explicit, you can see where it says long jump 
near the water, they're even more explicit kind of uh, mark out in the in the track paint that um, shows how long that uh, launch up was. It was 23 and a half feet, I believe. Um, we also are proposing to mark the 100 meter, which is halfway through, which is where the second marker is. That was one of his other medals. And then the fourth medal was a relay medal that he received in conjunction with a team. Um, and then we have located bike racks on this site in association with the first memorial. We put them there. Um, both because we know we'll get traffic coming over from the Harrison Dillard bikeway, but also to kind of incorporate the um, active element that we really wanted to uh, emphasize here. Um, we were asked at the previous meeting if we would consider changing the bike rack layout to look like the Olympic rings. And um, that logo is very heavily uh, copyrighted and policed. So um, we are opting not to do that, but we have arranged the rings so that from the roadway, they were perpendicular to the roadway before, and we've kind of arranged them parallel to the roadway so that they do at least kind of speak to that layout that the rings are in the Olympic logo um, without uh, representing it explicitly. Um, next slide. Um, just a close up on some of the elements that we have and um, the bike rack that we're using is a loop, uh, loop shaped round bike rack. And then we're also proposing a um, chain and post system uh, to protect the base of the tree that uh, matches what's already in the area in the park. Um, next slide. So this is an image of the podium seat wall and the memorial marker. The memorial markers are four feet tall. Kind of wanted them to have some substance without being something that felt like you couldn't see if somebody was standing on the other side of it, looking at it, you would feel kind of like it was a unknown. Um, and then one of the discussions that we had with the committee about the podium seat wall was they asked, could we more explicitly in the form of it represent um, the bronze, silver, and gold step ups instead of just the single step up? And because if we start with the 18 inch bench height, where we end up with that is a little over the 30 inches and it triggers handrail requirements. Um, so what we've opted to do is actually express that in the um, art component rather than in the form. And Angelica will talk a little bit more about that. Um, that might be, I think we'll move into the art now. Yeah, so um, if there's any questions about any of that, I'm happy to answer it before Angelica shows you um, the conceptual art. Why don't we uh, continue through the art and then we can ask our questions at the end. Okay. Okay, great. Um, so let's get the next uh, slide then. Um, okay, so then um, <clears throat> uh, looking at the, this shows the plan and the elevation of the seating wall. And so looking at the top uh, image, the, the, you see uh, faint circles uh, on there. And so I had already um, talked about that I was going to, on the podium, I was gonna have like a representative sort of of tree rings, circles um, in gold. Um, and that had already been in the plan. Um, and I'm gonna, um, so the, and then um, I was going to then, to drop off of that with the silver and gold, um, I'm gonna use some um, silver mosaic um, interspersed into the mosaic on the left side, um, and then uh, some bronze colored uh, mosaic on the, on the right side, and I'll show some samples of, of that, but um, from the the way as 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 the uh, gold Olympium is facing to their right, I believe, yeah, to their right would be the silver, and to their left would be the 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 bronze. And so I'm picturing as if the person is facing the um, the lagoon with the tree behind them as as the as the front, the so-called front of the podium. So that's how. Um, the seating is, and then um, 
the coloration on the side of the bench there had been a request to have more um, reference to Olympic and Olympic colors. And I had not really had a really strong inkling of what colors I wanted there. So that worked out perfectly. So those are the Olympic colors in their Olympic pattern um, along the side of the bench. So next slide, please. This shows um, sort of a um, physical uh, representation of the mosaic. It's um, they're about half inch square glass uh, gold with 24, 22 karat, 24 karat gold um, in them uh, mosaic. So they will be glimmering and shining and they will be kind of in this configuration on that three foot by three foot um, pattern. Uh, I mean, platform uh, podium. And then, um, and then the next slide, I think, shows the sample of the material. So then you'll see um, the both of those are gold, but one is white gold. And so then for the gold uh, metal uh, podium, I'll be using those little tiles um, to delineate um, the um, circle in between. Will then be broken tile mosaic. Um, the whole top of the bench on um, podium and the whole wings will be white. So on that white will be on the podium will be information about um, uh, Jesse Owens and the tree and, and more reference about him on the wings will be where of the bench will be where the responses, the community responses um, that I will then um, um, scribe in in handwriting um, uh, along and then intersperse these um, the silver and the bronze colored um, glass mosaic. And since all, all of these have gold or um, the bronze has little bits of gold in them, they will catch the light. And so I imagine that on a sunny day, you will see a gold glow coming from the platform and you will see a silver glow coming. Just there'll be just a little bit. You'll see a silver glow coming from the other one and the bronze glow. You'll see, I think that you will really be able to discern a difference in the glow coming up from the bench in the different with using with the use of these um, different um, mosaics. So next slide, please. And then this shows um, how I will um, the the um, the responses to the community. I will hand scribe. I'm, I'm imagining that the information for Jesse Owens, I think on the top, I will have it printed. So that's like informational, but then the community, there since it's like a personal thing, I will have a piece. Is there a, uh, I will have a, um, they will be handwritten. So next slide, please. And then these are the, these are the, um, the, the, um, the quotes and then the questions to the community. Um, I plan to have on the ends of the bench. So there's the length and then the very, um, um, ends of the bench. I plan to have the quotes there. And I also plan to have them um, in some place in the center part near the podium. So there's a few different um, um, areas that people can see the quote. And then I haven't quite completely figured out, um, but I know that since one side is smaller than the other, I didn't want to have like the dreams and the battles and the ones, you know, just have, you know, it delineated that only dreams on one side, only battles on the other side, invisible battles. So I'm uh, looking to maybe do use slightly different uh, color, um, uh, maybe brown and black or something with the writing um, um, so that you can discern which ones are, are battles and which ones dreams. And then just start from one end um, and then just sort of have them mix a little bit um, in, the, in the middle, but you can kind of tell the difference. So um, I'll, I'll work that out, but I want to have them on, on top where people can, um, and it mixed in in there. So um, next slide, please. And then on the sides, these are the tiles. Um, those will be two by two um, tiles and uh, for the Olympic colors. So this is the array of colors that they'll, so they'll be nice and brilliant and, and bright colors and they're suitable for exterior. So next slide shows, um, brings us back again to to um, see, um, to do that. And then on the side of the podiums, so on the south side, uh, facing the tree, um, I would like to, next slide, have a photograph of this image on, on, the, on that south side. On the north side, I plan to have that be sort of like a, a title kind of um, 
panel where it will say Jesse Owens Olympic Tree Plaza, um, and then there probably would be a depiction. Um, uh, Jamie was reluctant to create an Olympic um, form because it is uh, copyrighted, but we can use um, in reference to um, to uh, this, you know, since it's historical, we would be uh, permitted to use um, Olympic. So I do plan to use not a big Olympic um, um, image, but just somewhere so that it says, you know, Jesse Owens Olymp Olympic. And then um, some basic information about him, like maybe he was the, that he was the first uh, track person to win for gold medals in, in um, American or, or something rather, something very basic so that people who just happen to be passing by can like, oh, okay. Um, and then they'll have more information, um, more detailed information along the markers. So then we'll move on to the markers, I think, after this. Next slide. Yes, the next slide. Um, so then the markers then um, will have um, the edges, the, the thin edges will go from reds to yellow and um, to, re to uh, represent sort of a flame. Because the form, I think, reminds me both of a leaf and a flame, so that will represent a flame, and those will be in glass mosaic. Um, the the panels on the side will be in um, ceramic. Um, the circle um, will be the medallion forms that were I'll create sort of a, a Jesse Owens medal, and um, I think the next one is a close up. Next slide, please. Yes, as a close up. So I'll create um, like these medallion forms using different, um, you know, responding from different photographs of Jesse Owens at the Olympics. So this would be the broad drum and to incorporate the tree into the medallion. So those will be on, um, those will be, uh, those are two feet uh, diameter. So those will be on, um, on each of the, on uh, one side of each of the markers. Next slide, please. And this is a, another one um, for different for different ones. So that each one will be for for different ones. And next slide. And these are the photographs that I plan to um, use. I haven't worked them out, but to um, represent for the other two markers, um, I, you can see a faint circle. So I plan to fit them in there, so you can see him um, holding his his uh, oak uh, sapling and and saluting um, on the podium. And next slide. Please. Next slide, please. Okay, and then this is the other image. So I plan to use those four images to um, to represent um, to be in on the markers. Okay, next slide, please. And so then this shows the the whole marker. So then around that then will be um, a gradation of uh, of greens. So one side will be more warmer greens, and the other side will be a little darker and and a little bit cooler. So just how leaves are generally a little bit different on one side to the other. And so next slide does show the color of the tiles I'll be using. So I'll graduate from there to there. And so I plan, like in the past, a lot of my projects have had the photographs with a field of an um an you know a, a contrasting field of color behind them. So this time I plan to have this gradation and then just have the, the tiles be, um, and, uh, have the text and the photographs kind of work themselves in as if the, sh the page was green so that they'll, they'll be um, um, overlapped on the color. So from a distance, you'll still read the leaf as that gradation of color, but as you get up close, you'll see, you'll find um, images and stories and and different text um, along uh, interspersed in the mosaic. So there'll be some squares and rectangles and squares and um, surrounded by broken tongue mosaic in these colors. Next slide, please. And then this shows the darker side. And then next slide shows the colors of the tiles that I'll be working with. Um, and then next slide. And then along the the edge, then the glass the glass mosaic. So this represents. Um, I'll be using 12 millimeter um, um, glass mosaics, so actually a little bit smaller than these, but this in, in this similar col coloration. So they'll go um, from the deep red to the to yellows. And then um, next slide, please. I don't know if I show that, but um, oh, and then this is the the tile. So then um, on the right, that that is the size tile that I'll be using. So that is what that. Um, Edge will look like um, as far as the kind as um, you know the type of material I'll have. The um, 
I don't know if I have another image, but I had the um, um, the um, the red. So the way these are set up is that this side is what um, you see from the walk. So that that point that could poke your eye out or something or bonk your head on will actually be away from the sidewalk so that that will look towards the tree. Um, I was thinking that also that they're kind of aiming towards the tree or the flame is aiming towards the tree. The leaf is aiming towards the tree. So then that short end where it goes, it will go only to um, yellow and towards white will be there's no red as you as you're at the tree. You'll see the that yellow to white side. In, in there, I do want to intersperse some gold as well, so that from the tree, you'll see a little sparkle um, um, in there as well. So I think that might be the last, oh no, this, and then the, the photographs, this is just to uh, show how the photographs um, will be on a colored background and, and the text and they are readable. So I think that might be the last slide. Yes. All right, thank you for the detailed explanation. That was wonderful. Um, we will uh, begin with uh, asking for feedback from the local committee. Was there feedback from the local committee, Don? Uh, Madam Chair, there was no design review on this project. Um, right. I would want to remind the commission that although we saw this conceptually in January, we did take action on phase one, which was the landscaping and infrastructure plan with the uh, recommendations regarding the tiered podium, the reorienting of the bike rack, uh, and and the uh, representing the traditional Olympic colors in the project with the art portion to come back to the commission. Uh, so that's where we are today. I would also point out that Tara Petrus is with us today uh, uh, from the uh, City of Cleveland uh, Public Art Program. Thank you, uh, Ms. Petrus. Um, would you uh, have any feedback for us on this uh, installation? Yes. Um, first, I want to commend Angelica for the thought that went into this particular installation um, and a very thorough uh, uh, explanation of and level of detail of what she's doing. Um, and I think, and I said this before at the last meeting that. Just the fact that it's um, along the Harrison Dillard uh, bikeway is such an exceptional thing. Um, Harrison Dillard is a, a lesser known Olympian that was from Cleveland and he won the uh, 100 meter relay at the 52 Olympics in Helsinki. And he was also um, inspired by Jesse Owen. So um, I just wanna say, I think this concept is great. Um, the only question I had was how long before the tree matures into a more substantial size? Um, I would say, I mean, it, you can see from the pictures of the baby today in another 10 years, it will it will start to have some heft, but you know, an oak tree like this will live a hundred, 150 years. So it's probably 50 years before it really has that majestic scale that we imagine when we think of an oak tree. It'll get better every year. That's oh year. yeah. I know trees take a long time to get to really substantial size. Again, this is beautiful. The thought, the colors, everything that went into it. I'm excited to see the finished product. Thank you, Ms. Beatrice. Um, we'll then open the floor to the commission for questions and comments. Um, we'll begin with Mr. Edmund. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> I find this to be a, a very uh, elegant and sophisticated design. And um, I, I, I think the, the forms, the materiality um, are, are really, really well executed. Um, the, interestingly, the, um, the broken tile mosaic kind of reminds me of the Stephanie Tubbs Jones Memorial nearby. Which I don't know if that's intentional, but I think that's a really nice tie in, especially if you're on a bike or walking around. A um, <clears throat> couple of questions. So the on the markers, the medallions, is, is that cast metal or how how is that made and how, Those, the, how what's the structure of the markers themselves? 
Um, the the medallions are actually um, those are ceramic. Those are ceramic tiles. I have um, those are uh, porcelain paper tiles that I've already had had uh, water jet cut into a circle. So um, they're eight inch um, tiles initially. So so there'll be a center tile and four you know I mean um, eight sections around that are curved. So that it forms a circle. I had I used them in a, another project and. Um, on Buckeye where I did uh, um, circles with uh, other images in them. And I had some uh, leftovers of those circles and it just happened to have four leftovers. And that's what started me on this idea of having, um, you know, metal and, and, and medallions and creating an image um, you know, to represent. So those are, um, those will just be inset along with mosaic, broken tile mosaic around them. And is the figure a relief on that or is it? No, not relief, they're, they're flat, they'll be painted on. They'll be um, uh, painted on, but the way I will be um, deck, um, rendering them, I'm going to be rendering them to look to have um, to look dimensional, to have you know to ha give the the look of um, like a coin um, mm -hmm. that has some dimensional relief. So it, it will have a, a look of dimension, but it won't be dimensional. And how is the marker itself built? What's the structure of the marker? Those are you know Jamie can. Uh, to, yeah, there you go. <laughs> We're having them replicated at a precast, and the, those that the, they'll be made with a recess where the tile sits, so that the tile is kind of inset, a little bit protected from the weather, and has mm -hmm. uh, a little bit of a ledge to sit on at the bottom edge to okay. protect it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Edmund. Mr. Trasic. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first of all, I just want to commend. Uh, this project as well. Um, I think it's very, very long overdue. I, I would often walk or run by the uh, the statue of Jesse Owens. It's downtown here behind the courthouse, uh, and think how uh, how woefully inadequate uh, that was to to represent all of this man means has meant. Um, my question is is, is that is uh, will that statue remain downtown, or is that statue? And maybe I missed this. Or will that statue be somehow incorporated into this project as well? So it's a good question that's been asked a lot lately. <laughs> that statue is a part of the county's collection of uh, memorials and is overseen by a commission that asked me to present to them last week about this project as they consider the future really of all of all county memorials, but um, particularly this one. So. Um, there's not been a decision made and, you know, this is an improvement that UCI is moving forward with in a city park. So, ultimately, that would come down to an agreement between the county and the city. Um, but there's certainly been some discussion around just that no plan at this moment. Thank you, Ms. Trasek and Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is a wonderful, thoughtful project. Um, it'll be a welcome addition to uh, the park. Um, my question is regarding um, the uh, installation of all of the components. I just want to make sure that uh, there's been some thought put into um, the long-term um, wear and tear on the, uh, uh, you know, on the tiles and all and all the components. Um, Cleveland weather can be pretty harsh with the uh, freeze thaw cycles, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot of activity in that area. So I just want to make sure that uh, this um, lovely um, uh, installation will be able to. Um, last for for many years and we'll be able to enjoy it for many years to come yeah thank you miss anderson um it was referenced before but angelica did do the stephanie Tubbs jones uh memorial plaza with us at, at uci at, which was completed back in 2012 so one of the reasons why we were really um I will just say one of the reasons we're excited to work with Angelica was that we had done so before. We do have an understanding of um, both the longevity of her work in a public space and you know the frequency of, of maintenance. So we have worked together to continue to maintain 
Stephanie Tubbs Jones Plaza, we will continue to do that here and our, um, you know, as with any improvement in a public space, we'll have to commit to the city that we will be taking on the maintenance of this. So that's very much in our, um, in the forefront of our minds as well. Uh, and we feel good that we have this precedent of the Stephanie Tubbs Jones Plaza, which is very actively used, climbed on. <laughs> um, uh, so we, we, uh, we feel like we have a better sense of what we're getting ourselves into. I'm prepared to maintain it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Um, I would echo what my fellow commission members have said. I, I think this is very thoughtful. Um, it is, it's been thought from you know, the beginning to the end um, with every little detail. I think it's really um, going to be an asset to the area. Uh, and I like, even though you listened to our feedback and maybe didn't apply it in the way that we asked, um, it was a very creative application. That will let people know that this is really, you know, a, a celebration of you know, um, Mr. Uh, Jesse Owens and his achievements in the Olympics. So I think it's just a great installation. And I'm in support of the, the artwork and the adjustments to the design. Um, Ms. Beatrice, did you have additional comments? Yes, um, one of them was asked about, um, I know the landscape architect for the city, Jim McKnight, did ask about moving the statue, but my other comment was that um, the councilwoman Stephanie House was very supportive of this project as well, so I just wanted to put that on record. Thank you, that's very helpful. Mr. Edmond, you had additional com uh, comments? Uh, yeah, just, just quickly um, regarding the statue, I, I don't think this design needs a statue. I think it's very um, sort of complete as it is. So um, if the statue, if, if that doesn't work out with the statue coming here or, or whatever, I think that's just fine. I think having the statue downtown and this here is a, is a very nice um, solution. I think this is really a complete design the way it is. That's all. We have Councilman Jones with us today. Yeah, I just, uh, you know, saw some of the, the presentation, not all of it, though, but what I did see, I'm, I'm really impressed. I wanted to take uh, the opportunity to say thank you to uh, the people who have put all of this together, all of the many people, I'm sorry, uh, don't, um, uh, you know, uh, I, I really, you know, I don't know all the players. That's the reason why I apologized. Um, but I really like what is uh, being uh, talked about and articulated here. And I really appreciate uh, all the hard work that's been put into this. And that's just my two cents. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you back, Mr. Uh, Councilman Jones. Um, with the show of support and uh, no more questions or comments from the commission, would someone like to put forward a motion? Um, I, I will move that we approve as presented. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Do we have a second? Mr. Trasic? Uh, Madam Chair, I'll second. Excellent. Thank you. Any further discussion? All right, Mr. Pettit, please call roll and announce the results. Ms. Anderson? Yes. Mr. Bonazzi? Yes. Mr. Dreyer? Mr. Edmund. Yes. Uh, Mr. Strickland. Yes. Mr. Tarasic. Yes. Ms. Trott. Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Excellent. We look forward to seeing this move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Run. We'll move on to our next applicant, uh, located at 4612 Clinton Avenue, new construction of a single family house. Uh, good morning. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. All right. Um, my name's uh, Tony Kusha. I'm the, uh, the builder for the project. Um, our architect had to catch a flight this morning. I'm sure, uh, I think he, he made uh, Car uh, Mr. Burns and uh, Mr. Pettit aware. Uh, Mr. Uh, Wells, the homeowner is also on the call. Welcome. Mark, are you there? Yep, I'm here, thank you. 
Okay. Um, so I was just going to um, recap. Uh, I guess I could. Uh, you could um, uh, focus on the changes that since we did see this just a few weeks ago, if you could just oh. focus on you know, the changes that your team has made related to the design, um, that would be very helpful. Okay, perfect. I wasn't sure how much past detail. So comments brought up um, on the March 3rd meeting um, were discussed. Uh, I've got several bullet points. Um, I, I guess probably if you could go to the front elevation, which would be the south elevation, that would be best. Um, yes. And if we could focus on the uh, I guess if you can make the south elevation larger, I'm not sure if you can zoom in on it or not. Um, I can zoom, but uh, each person I uh, can zoom via the WebEx uh, tools located okay. on the left side of the screen. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I zoomed up on it. Um, so I guess this is a, a good slide to stay on in regards to several of the bullet points that were mentioned. Um, so it, these aren't in any order. Um, one of the items was, is to rethink the color of the mortar on the brick. Um, it, it, it last time on the March 3rd meeting, it was a, a whitish color brick. So there's a, a very large contrast between the brick and the mortar. And now we've matched uh, a color match, a very close, uh, mortar color to the brick. So it, it, it looks more unis, un, uniform. We discussed uh, eliminating the base. If you, if you start on the uh, left portion of the elevation, which would then be the Southwest corner and work your way across, uh, across to the porch and then across the base of the porch, we had another element where it was the foundation itself that was showing and it also returned up the to the north on both the west and the east elevation we've eliminated per the request of landmarks uh commission uh, or cons or, uh, conversations uh and to go to less materials and so we've now carried the brick facade down to the grade um, as our as our grade gradient moves from the south to the north we, we uh, get higher. So we have more exposed uh, foundations exposed here on the south elevation and less as we get to the north elevation. So we've changed that. The symmetry of the windows, um, before we had uh, asymmetrical configuration here on the front elevation, and we um, really looked, deep dove into this with Chris and the homeowner, Mr. Wells and Janet, his fiance, and really uh, took the time to create a much more symmetrical look that's more appeasing and more historic. And you can see the results here. Um, we were asked to create a front facing uh, door. And that is something that the Wells, uh, Mark and Janet do not wanna change. But I think with the symmetrical look and that it, 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 it's, it's apparent that it's um, uh, the, the door being uh, facing the east um, really still to show uh, historic, historic characterizations um, and, and, and it's not something that they do not want to change. We centered the home, uh, more centered the home on the property. Um, we shifted it um, from the west property line. It was at three feet and, and now we've slid it over so that we have uh, the five foot dimension, as you can see. And we changed from a 13 foot Eastern property line distance to now 10 feet, excuse me, from 12 feet down to 10 feet, a two foot difference. We were uh, uh, discussing uh, eliminating uh, brick facade on the front elevation. And that's something um, that the wells in, in moving forward and purchasing the land and building in the historic district really hung their hat on as brick being a, a, a big part of their historic 
look and historic uh, concept uh, for the home that they plan on living in for a very long time. And so they're very strong on keeping the amount of brick on the south elevation along is on the east elevation, as you can see um, below on this slide. I will tell you, we did eliminate, again, getting materials down in the quantity of them. We eliminated the limestone heads and went with a soldier course and a limestone um, sill, and we're going with a Rolox sill. So again, using the brick material as its its own detail in keeping the amount of materials down in quantity. The other large component in discussions, uh, both uh, over time with Block Club and the the board or the commission, excuse me, was the pitch of the roof. And albeit the wells really were pushing back on making it steeper, um, in, in some advice that we had, we changed the pitch and now the pitch of the roof matches. And you can see on another slide, I thought that would be good lead in. Uh, yeah, next door. So we, the door, uh, excuse me, the home. Uh, so on the south contextual, yes, the home to the west, we match their pitch, albeit we're wider, the pitch is the same. Um, I'm looking through my notes here, I apologize. I think the last comment that was mentioned, and it was it was kind of a yes, the um, the door itself, the garage door, um, was white in color, and we um, were able to change it to either a black color shown, and or um, and or maybe the siding color. Again, it's getting lost. It's either going to match the window color or the siding color. We're still working on. Um, those finalization uh, items, and as and on the um, let's see, there's another on the, uh, the stairwell. The stairwell uh, material will also be a black aluminum color. Um, yes, on the garage, so that is no longer a standout item as far as a different color scheme. I think that's all I have for right now as far as the the major points. Mark, would you like to add anything? No, I just uh, would add that, you know, of all of the feedback that we've gotten, we've addressed and accommodated, you know, all of the 40 plus recommendations. And um, I think the, the biggest remaining piece for the Ohio City Commission was really looking towards the peak of the house. And so we, we hope that, you know, we're at the matching peak now that resolves most of it, but that was their feedback that if the peak were were fixed along with the the mortar color and the garage door color, so that you didn't have such contrast, which we addressed all of those, that uh, they were in support. So I think we're we're there now. Excellent. Well, thank you for the presentation and the um, an overview of how you've addressed each item. Um, we will begin with feedback or an update from the local design review committee. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, May Law from Ohio City Incorporated. Um, we saw this project on uh, March 17th. Um, there was no quorum in the meeting, uh, but of the three present members, all agreed the design had come a long way uh, from the beginning and appreciated the uh, architect and the homeowner's uh, willingness to listen to the feedback of the committee um, the three present members also stated, uh, as Mark mentioned, if the roof pitch was heightened uh, and the garage door and the staircase color were darkened, they would have recommended approval um, had they had quorum. Uh, two non-present members provided uh, written feedback that stated the window types needed further simplification and the roof pitch was still too shallow. 
Um, one member stated they would not approve of the project in its current iteration, um, but uh, I believe the homeowner here has met the intent of the design review and uh, ultimately the present members recommended approval. Thank you. Thank you. We'll then open up the floor to the commission for questions or comments. Mr. Strickland. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I very much appreciate that the applicant has addressed uh, virtually all of the comments that we had from the original presentation. I think this is a extremely handsome home and will fit wonderfully into the uh, neighborhood on Clinton Ave. Thank you, Mr. Strickland. Ms. Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I, I do see the local design reviews point. I do think that the roof pitch would be more appropriate for the scale of this house if it matched um, what these houses of similar scale have as opposed to the smaller, more worker cottage roof pitch. Um, a little disappointed with the brick color because there isn't really anything historic in the area with that brick color. Um, and I don't know this for, for a fact. I, I'm not a real student of feng shui, but I think the eastern facing, I think the front door is supposed to face the front, but you know, I, I we're not we're not establishing feng shui here. It's more the historic, but you know, I, I, I appreciate that the applicant did try to make accommodations for um, the request from this body and the local design review committee. Um, you know, I am I loving this? No, but I do appreciate that they did try to. Um, incorporate some of the suggestions. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Mr. Bonazzi. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was just going to echo the comments of fellow members, Strickland, especially since I think I believe I was one of the ones who made a lot of the comments this time. I wanted to thank the applicant for kind of uh, addressing those. And I do um, see most, if not all of those changes taken into account. So um, I think it'll be a very lovely house. I do agree with the um, kind of front proportions of the house. You know, it's difficult when you have that kind of a width to get the pitch that you want, because ultimately you'd end up with like a 35 foot tall house. And that would also be out of context with the neighborhood. So it's a lot of game of proportions that I think it's, you have to give and you take. Um, but overall, I'm excited that you guys uh, listened and um, I think it'll be a lovely house. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Benazi. Um, my only comment would be, and I know this is a new one, but it's just something for consideration, not a requirement, is that I would look at maybe your stairs up to your porch. Um, you know, you have, you know, you're trying to you work within the traditional um, configurations, and you know, if the stairs were slid to the center of the house, that would probably be more, give you more usable porch to actually enjoy versus, you know, a, much of your porch is going to be dedicated to the circulation. So, um, I know that didn't come up before. That's more of just a, a personal preference, um, which is something to consider as you continue to move this forward. Um, but I echo much of what is said. You know, I think this has come a long way. I uh, appreciate you listening to the commission and the, the committee and the commission um, to incorporate you know, the um, suggestions that have been made to you. Thank you. Ms. Ms. Trotka, this is Mr. Wells. Can I just add one comment real quickly? Sure. Um, we originally had those stairs to the eastern side of the front porch and we're asked to center those. That's why they ended up where they did. But I agree okay. with you. <laughs> Is eastern to the right or to the left? I'm sorry. To the right. To, to the right. You can go right or left, either one. It's, it's, we had it off-centered, but we had it to the eastern side, which is the right. And we're asked to center it, to center it which we did. Well, I guess the other thought would be to center it on the house, um, which may allow, you know, more porch to the right side of that south elevation. 
Um, yeah, so I mean, it's, 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 you know, yeah I, I don't mind that at all. Uh, again, we were just either either direction, but we were asked to center it and that's why it ended up where it did was my point. So we, we can certainly move that and actually it will line up with the front door and the center windows, I believe. Y yes, yes, we discussed okay. that as a potential before when we were asked to move it. And I think that's a great idea because you're closest to the door with guests and you have a much more usable area for entertaining. Yep, I totally I agree. Fellow commission members, if they have feedback, I saw Ms. Anderson had her hand up too, Ms. Anderson. I agree with uh, moving the stairs. I, I I think that would would be an improvement. Mr. Benazzi? I would also second that kind of a um, that formal move in composition with the facade. So blend you know with your neighbor next door. Um, you had in the similar proportions with the center um, stairs. Well, thank you for being open to that uh, comment. Uh, other questions or comments from the commission? Would someone like to put forward a motion? Mr. Strickland? Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll uh, move to approve the project as presented with the incorporation of the comment to move the uh, front entry stair to the west so that it aligns with the uh, central line of the uh, front windows. Thank you for that motion. With that on, on note, do we have a second? Mr. Edmund? I'll second that. Thank you. We have a motion. We have a second. Any further discussion? All right, Mr. Pettit, please call roll and announce the results. Ms. Anderson. Yes. Mr. Bonazzi. Yes. Mr. Dreyer. Yes. Mr. Edmund. Yes. Mr. Strickland. Yes. Mr. Tarasic. Yes. Ms. Trott. Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you Great. for the presentation and good luck with your project. Thank you very much. Thank Have you. a good day. Thank you. We'll move on to our next applicant, uh, the new construction of the concept of a pocket park plaza and petite commercial development uh, at the Waver Waverly, Waverly and Oaks Phase 2 uh, project. Thank you. Good morning. Happy to be back here. Uh, we were here last month for concept review of, of this plan. Um, since then, we've had a number of conversations you know, with and meetings at the local level with with local stakeholders and um, neighbors and and leaders of the community. Um, so we're excited to show the the improvements that we've made and the changes. So first, I'll talk kind of about the existing condition uh, in the history of the property before outlining our plan proposal, uh, which overall calls for a sidewalk park fronting a uh, parking area as I'll discuss later. Um, you know, we do have expectations down the road for the park to become a small scale commercial structure. So uh, we'll get into all that. Um, since we were just here uh, a few weeks ago, I know that maybe some, some members had to drop off because it was later in the agenda. So I'm gonna go through basically the full presentation uh, just to make sure nothing's missed. Uh, the first two slides just show kind of an overall um, location of the property on Detroit Avenue between West 54th and West 58th. Uh, slide three will show us the these parcels that we're talking about today six, sits adjacent to the Waverly and Oak project, uh, which broke ground in October. The next slide as well. Uh, and the next slide, please. The parcels we're talking about today are the three that sit immediately to the east. So it's uh, going from left to right, 5428, 5420, and 5416 Detroit. There are two existing buildings on site that you can see here uh, on the next slide, please. The uh, 5428 is the former Minon building that, that's going to be the new home to, to Banter. And then 5416, which is the building that, that's shown here, um, is kind of the nondescript warehouse building uh, that sits on the, on the furthest east 
uh, section of the property. Um, next slides show you some interior shots. So the, the building's been modified over a number of years. The front portion, I think Carl mentioned at the concept review that uh, the front portion was, was built in 1978 or modified in 1978. Um, it's been vacant for uh, a number of years. It was most recently used as storage space for, um, for the previous owner. Uh, previous historical uses, as far as we know, included a tool and die shop, a paint store, uh, some office space, um, and as far as we can tell, a shooting range in the basement. Um, so the two-story, if we could go back one slide, please. The two-story apartment building included a, um, an apartment on the second floor, and then a uh, there's a large gate uh, fence that kind of spans between the two existing buildings on site. Uh, and then uh, slide nine, please. So I think we're two up. Yeah. So um, a little bit of, of how we got here. Uh, since we first launched the public engagement process for Waverly and Oak, uh, it was about this time last year, last winter, uh, we've heard consistently from neighboring businesses, from community leadership, from residents, um, and from this commission of a few things, but two of the most uh, repeated comments that we've heard and had conversations about has been one a concern about parking in the neighborhood and, and on this block and uh, also street beautification and the pedestrian experience. Uh, so our goal for this project has always been to achieve slightly greater than a one to one parking ratio for our 126 apartments. Um, to that end, we had discussed with this commission last year that we were working on parking arrangements with neighboring properties. Uh, those conversations particularly with the former owners of these parcels that we're talking about today, um, developed into acquisition of the properties. Um, and in the multiple iterations of our plan leading up to this final presentation, we've really been working to achieve a balance between the parking needs of the community, the increased parking demand that our project is going to introduce to the community um, and, and to local businesses uh, with with also balancing that with the intention of the pedestrian retail overlay where our property sits um, in this district and, and which strives to really improve the pedestrian experience and focus on really overall uh, urban fabric. Um, so uh, next slide, please. So we've worked with uh, local design review, with city planning uh, to modify the plans that we've shown previously um, and, and have worked to get the, the support of those groups um, next slide, please. So, so again, we're really working to, to, on this balance between the parking need and the pedestrian experience. So what we're proposing here is the demolition of 5416 Detroit, the warehouse building. Um, it's a 37 space uh, surface parking lot that sits to the rear of the properties uh, for use by residents of the new project and commercial patrons of the property. Uh, the single curb cut that you see here just to the right of the existing building um, we're utilizing that existing curb cut the parking area itself is set back 37 feet approximately from uh, from the face of the sidewalk so what that allows for is a, a roughly 2800 square foot park with landscaping and fencing uh, because we're really focused on uh, blocking the view of the cars from the from the pedestrians as well from the street so that, that the park itself has roughly doubled in size since our first presentations of, of this proposal. Uh, also includes bicycle parking, some seating, um, and, and some greenery and landscaping. Uh, so it, you know, this plan's worth noting that the originally on the overall site, there were three curb cuts along Detroit. We've eliminated two of those. We're maintaining this one, and we've rerouted uh, most of the residential traffic to Tillman. Um, one of the previous curb cuts was in this space between, on the left of the, the plan, the space between the new building and the existing building. It's going to be utilized as uh, outdoor seating. Uh, next slide, please. It just shows some, some inspiration images of what this, this park could look like. This is how we're thinking about it. Um, the, the next two slides are a response to really the feedback we heard at the local design review level. Um, where we had a lot of the conversation at the local level was around what this park looks and feels like and what the function is. Um, 
the, the preference at the local level was for more landscape beds, for more greenery, for more grasses, um, as opposed to hardscape. So this slide and the next slide are just studies that we've worked on with Dimmit over the past few weeks to um, just study that, that suggestion, which we think is, is a good one. Uh, and then next slide, please. So the, this proposal does have two phases to it. Um, <clears throat> the, what, what I just talked about being that park is um, kind of the short to medium term plan for, for this parcel. Um, the longer term plan is for the, that park area to serve as the footprint for a future commercial building on the site. Um, and we can jump to the next slide, please. And the next one. And so the concept is that this, this park parcel becomes a small scale retail building, one or two stories. Of course, you know, the design would, would come later, but that's kind of our, our long-term vision for this property is to have uh, a structure on site. Uh, the next slide kind of shows some images of what this retail commercial space could look like. What we've tried to show here is a range of possibilities from more traditional architecture and aesthetics to more contemporary and modern, um, and, and just really cover the spectrum there. Uh, this it would it would be designed in partnership with with eventual eventual tenant. Um, you know we've discussed the possibility of a live work concept with the retail operator living in an apartment above, in a two story building, kind of a, an allusion to to the history of of this site um, and to the neighborhood. Uh, that now that design would come down the road when we identify a tenant um, and again that's a response to uh, local leadership concerns about additional new construction speculative retail space so that's that's why it's phased um, so we could jump back to i think maybe the zoomed in plan of the of the park and the parking lot and then um yeah any of any of these plans we could talk about um and that's the entirety of the presentation so look forward to comments and questions thank you Thank you. We'll start with feedback from the local design review committee, Mr. Kidd from Northwest Neighborhoods. Um, I I'm probably defer to Carl as far as general notes. I can tell you that the CDC um, it participated in the local meetings. We uh, offered some of the initial feedback in regards to design, deferred to planning in regards to the setback, but are supportive of uh, the current design plan. We think it's um, consistent with some of the streetscaping work that has been done on Detroit Avenue in the last 10 years. Uh, this is adjacent to the special improvement district, which um, we, you know, have for about 10 years now been continually trying to improve the streetscape aesthetic there on Gordon Square. So we think this is consistent. We're also supportive of a longer term strategy for retail in that space, given the fact that there will be some additional retail on the space that will either be activated or uh, created. So. Um, we're pleased with the design and uh, I'll defer to Carl if there's any additional uh, notes he'd like to add. Mr. Brunges. Thank you, Madam Chair. This uh, was reviewed on the 9th of March by the Gordon Square Design Review Committee. Uh, there was, a, as Mr. Trizzi mentioned, there was a lot of discussion about um, reducing hardscape in this park and adding more green space, which he has done in his presentation here. They did recommend the approval of the demolition of 5416 Detroit Avenue, and they recommended uh, more, again, less hardscape, more overall green space. Uh, with the final landscape selections uh, to return to the committee, should also note that um, final details for Waverly and Oak Phase 1 still need to return, I believe, some plaza details. So I think we will be looking at this holistically for both phase one and phase two with final details at some point in the future as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brunges. Um, and I believe we have Adam Dadam, Davenport here from Planning Commission or Planning Department. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think overall we're we're supportive of this 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 concept too. Um, you know, the zoning code itself this is one of our pedestrian retail overlay districts as i I've talked before in a previous meeting 
uh, which states that there should be no new parking spaces within 40 feet of the front setback of a lot. Um, that dimension, to my understanding, um, from my colleague Kyle, who has who has since left CPC, was created as you know, a, a kind of a buffer zone for the allowance of of new buildings in the future. Obviously, that's not always going to be perfect or completely prescriptive, which is kind of what we want to get to in more of um, our new zoning code, the form based code, where there is kind of percentage alleviations for for this because every situation isn't always perfect. So dimensionally, you know, um, I think this meets the essence of, of what we're trying to get at. This is, although it's not a perfect 40 feet, I think what we want to try and preserve with that rule is for the ability of a building to be built here in the future and continue that urban fabric. So short of the zoning code dictating that a property owner must build a building, which is not the case right now, and I'm not necessarily advocating for that. Um, this is kind of the scenario that I think will happen with with larger projects. Um, and certainly, you know, we've been supportive of, of the overall Waverly Note plan before. So um, in short, I think this meets the essence of the code, um, and I'm glad to see something, um, you know, continually evolving with the the yeah, um, WNO overall concept. Thank you. Thank you for that update or that uh, um, feedback. Uh, Mr. Brundes, do you want to update the commission before we start with um, their questions and comments about variances? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and Adam, perhaps you can confirm this. Did this receive a variance or a conditional use from uh, planning commission last Friday to move it from 40 feet to 36 feet? The, the yes, Carl, the, the planning commission granted the conditional use of this um, or for this for this this parcel. Uh, Justin is aware that he will still end up at BZA for uh, the parking lot in the PRO area which is um, typical of this situation, I guess, overall. So that'll be a necessary next step for him. Thank you for that update. Well, then uh, we'll now open the floor to the commission, Mr. Admin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first, a, a question for you. It, we are just approving conceptual uh, design for the Pocket Park Plaza now, right? Is that what we're... That was actually going to be one of my uh, questions here to um, and thank you. I uh, failed to ask before I opened the floor. So, um, Mr. Brundes, you want to update us? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, how the this was handled at the locals, they approved the site plan as presented for everything that you see here with the potential park and then that the final details of the park come back later because i think nothing else is really going to change here what's being presented on the site it's just whatever the final details of the park would be in the overall landscape so which one did they uh approve option one or option two they didn't choose either because you see that the layout is the same it's, of the it's, parking the, yeah so the park see nothing changes about the site except what the final landscaping and choices are for the park. So that's, they said, here's the site plan. We approve this, come back when you figure out what your final plan is gonna be for the park itself. Cause that's the only item that would change in this. Yeah, essay, in this. yeah so our, under, our understanding was everything within that, you know, when, when Carl was toggling back and forth within that 36 by 70 foot, 75 foot box, that still has to come back for final review of landscape selection, planting selection, fencing materiality, um, everything outside of that received final approval at landmarks. Or I'm sorry, at local. At local design review. So basically the parking layout on, but not the landscaping and the final design within that area. Correct. 
And just for clarification, before I will go back to Mr. Edmund and your questions and comments, is it actually 36.6 or what is the dimension to the right to the east side of the where the is that 36.6 to that curb line for that island or to the that's the right. Island? Yep. It's 36.6 on the left side, and I believe it's 32 and change on the to the furthest uh, right side. Okay. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. Um, I just uh, said the dimensions were throwing me just because I, the east side is less than that 36, so thank you. Um, we'll move back to Mr. Edmonds, your questions and comments before I jump into mine. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so a couple of things. So the, the existing two-story commercial building shown here, that's the Minon building, correct? Correct. And the, the idea is that that would remain and be, be renovated as a new commercial building? Yeah, so that, that uh, ground floor commercial space has been leased to Banter. Um, right. They're going to be doing a, a renovation and occupying that ground floor. So that's happening as part of phase one. So that'll happen. That's soon. right. Yeah, that's yeah. in the works right now. And then um, the phase two building, do you have an idea of the timeline of that building? So like how long would this park be here uh, before it gets built out? Yeah, so uh, the short answer is is no, we don't have a timeline for that. Um, we, uh, we would like that to be soon. Um, our, our plan is to find the right tenant um, and make that work. Um, so there has been throughout this process kind of the conversation about the temporary nature of this park um, and how that, you know, the balance between uh, investing enough in this park that it's um, attractive and functional um, and, and doing all the things that we would like it to be doing um, while not over investing where we're now disincentivized to actually build the structure here. Um, so that's, you know, short, so that's the long answer, but the short answer is no, we don't have a, a set timeline for when that structure happens. Okay. Um, so I, re I realize now that this is beyond uh, what we're approving today, but between the two options of the of the park design, and I don't know which way you're, you know, we may end up leaning, but I think that option one is certainly a much more engaged design, more intentional looking, um, much more attractive to want to enter that area and sit down and spend time. I also recognize it's more of an investment. Um, so uh, realizing that that's not necessarily what we're approving here today, I think the, the option one is a really nice development of the design for the small park. Thank you. Thanks for your comments. Yeah, I think it, it is helpful if if part of the conversation today is about you know comparing and contrasting these these park options so that when we come back and present, um, we can have some direction on where where we think the the design should go. So we appreciate that. Thank you. Can you clarify you know, what you mean by short term? Um, is this within one to two years, or is this within you know five to ten years? What is your definition of short term? Yeah, so I think you know I, again, I don't know that we we know that if if it could be if we could find the right tenant and and um, and be back here a you know a year or two from now presenting a design, we would love that. Um, the more temporary this park is for us, the better. Um, because we ultimately do, and our initial, our initial initial proposal was for um, a building here. So it's kind of it's it's evolved, um, but our desire is for there to be a building here uh, as soon as we can find the right tenant to make the business plan work. So to me, that's the difficulty of this. I mean, I would echo Mr. Edmonds. I think the option one is much uh, more engaging and really would be an asset to the neighborhood. Um, it could be an extension of what was discussed um, for the parcel adjacent to it, because I believe your line uh, aligns with their fence line. So this could be a, really a, a wonderful amenity that you know both of you have. Right now, I think I don't believe that one's actually been installed either um, when I was by there recently. But I would recommend option, you know, I think um, option one is much more engaging. As Mr. Edmund said, I think it would really um, shield the parking better um, by how you configured it or my understanding of it. Um, and if that's your intention, I, I guess I would also like to see how, you know, if you would take that 
and I'm sorry if I missed it. Uh, Carl, could you go to the next slide? Do we have the site plan with your intended building location? I'm sorry if I. Yeah, and I, and I I will say I think we're what we what we have been trying to keep in mind is that over the next one to two years, this block is going to change pretty dramatically with when uh, when the larger building opens. Um, and so we want to make sure that we're being um, open minded about this park. If it turns out, you know, 18 months from now that there, this park is getting a ton of use and the neighborhood really loves it. That's something that we're going to adapt to and we're going to be open to that conversation of keeping it. So I think that it, it just it, it really is going to be kind of a, <clears throat> a living, breathing component of this plan. Um, and that we have to see how it how it um, how the community responds to it and how it kind of lives in the wild once it's open. I, mean, I think, like I said, option one would be my recommendation um, because it obviously would be uh, more engaging and I think accepted by the and used by the community. Um, but obviously, there it is a larger investment. Um, the parking, I don't have a problem with it extending to the 32 feet, you know, uh, because of the size of the property and, you know, the need to try to uh, use this amongst them. basically two different uses or three, you know, potentially the existing building and, you know, the future new building in the parking lot. Um, I think if the intent is, is to put a building there, then um, the requirement for a variance to me is uh, less of a um, highlight or a focus because of that. Um, but if the space is going to remain a, a park for a period of time, I personally prefer option one. Um, Ms. Anderson, you have questions and comments also? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I um, applaud the applicant's thoughtful um, consideration of this, this park, and I also applaud their uh, recognition that uh, additional parking is going to be required, especially to keep these um, businesses viable and um, the, uh, the residents of this building will probably have friends. So uh, I think that's that's a necessity. Now, I just want to be clear, the curb cut is off of the back. Right, there is no curb cut on Detroit. So there's the the project has two curb cuts. Um, the uh, if we can go to the overall site plan, I think it'd be the most helpful. So um, uh, next slide, if we could. Uh, oh, yeah, I see what you're showing. Um, so there's off of Tillman, which is to the north. So the northwest corner is the ramp for the uh, residential parking garage. That's curb cut one. Curb cut two is this lot that we're talking about today. Uh, it exists right now between these two buildings. Um, so it's it's shifting. Yep, Carl's showing it there. It's shifting a few feet to the left, which allows more of a continuous park block um, to the to the east of the site. Okay, I th that was my question. I wasn't sure if that. If that was decorative paving or whatever was shown there, because I, I mean, I know how to get to Tillman Avenue, but somebody from out of the area is not. So I just wanted to make sure that they can access that parking so they can um, easily, they can easily find the parking uh, so they can, you know, um, Go to the the area businesses or or visit friends. So I I just wanted to see where that they would enter. So it looks like they could enter off of Detroit, uh, in that one curb cut. Yeah, that's right. And and just for clarification, the the it's not a it's not intended to be a public parking lot. Oh, great. Okay. So they're, but yes, point point taken. All right, uh, and I, yeah, I think uh, this looks good, and I, I lean, of course, towards uh, the the design number one. Um, 
I think it's a very attractive design. So uh, yeah, I overall I approve. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Other questions or comments from the commission? Would someone like to put forward a motion? Uh, Madam Chair, I just want to remind the commission that we, we need to take two votes today. One on the uh, proposal for the landscaping and the park and the parking and one for the uh, demolition of the existing building. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Pettit. So we'll begin with, uh, would someone like to make a motion on the concept plan? I'm sorry, not concept plan, the um, the uh, proposed plan, site plan. Mr. Edmund. Uh, I'll move that the uh, proposed plan be approved with the notation that uh, the recommendation is something like option one for the site design. And do you agree with the condition that they must uh, return with final landscaping design yes. and details? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bonazzi? Um, I would second that motion as being preemptive. That was perfect. Uh, with the condition uh, that was noted? Yes, with those conditions. All right, thank you. We have a motion, we have a second. Any further discussion? Not seeing any. Mr. Pettit, um, please call roll and announce the results. Ms. Anderson? Yes. Mr. Bonazzi? Yes. Mr. Dreyer? Yes. Mr. Edmund? Yes. Mr. Strickland? Yes. Mr. Tarasic? Yes. Ms. Trott? Yes. The motion to approve the site plan uh, is approved unanimously. Thank you. Um, now I will ask, will someone like to put forward a motion on a demolition? This is uh, Michelle Anderson. I approve that. I, I, I move that we approve the demolition of the um, vacant uh, commercial building. Thank you for that motion. Do we have a second? Mr. Dreyer? Uh, yes, I'll second. Thank you, Mr. Dreyer. So we have a motion. We have a second. Any further discussion? No. Ms. Pettit, please call roll and announce the results. Ms. Anderson? Yes. Mr. Bonazzi? Yes. Mr. Dreyer? Yes. Mr. Edmund? Yes. Mr. Strickland? Yes. Mr. Tarasic? Yes. Ms. Trott? Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Excellent. Well, we look forward to seeing your project progress. Thank you very much, everyone. And to see you return with the details with the landscaping um, for the adjacent phase one and phase two. Absolutely. Thanks for your comments. Thank you. Um, we'll move on to the next applicant located, uh, the Stewart residence located at 13519 Corby Road, solar panel installation. Is the applicant present? Uh, Madam Chair, I'm not seeing the applicant in the participant list. I know I sent her. I know she got the link to the meeting um, and, and she confirmed yesterday that she would be here, but maybe I need to resend it. Uh, I would suggest that we move to the next item. Okay, we'll move on. I'll move us ahead. And we'll move on to the Apollo Apartments located at 1250 Riverbed Road. <clears throat> and I believe, Carl, you're going to start us off on this one. Is that right? 
I'm sorry, I'm looking at my, what, as you're scrolling through, did I? Yes. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just want to quickly introduce this. This uh, project is actually interesting because the building itself is in a National Register Historic District, but it is not an individual or is not a locally designated building. So the purview of the building repairs does not fall to the Landmarks Commission, so it should not be looked at. However, the, via, the Superior Viaduct is an individually designated landmark for local, so that's where the purview lies. So we're looking at two elements, realistically, on the impacts on the Superior Viaduct, and the first is this connection here, which they'll go into greater detail. I just wanted to get some good site visit photos so you could see what it, the current conditions are up close. So this is the only where it actually touches, but then they also have, um, they're introducing a small area beneath it that is going to be reviewed as well. So this, those are the only items. And I think Tana Bell is gonna, he's gonna over, give an overall view of what's going on with the building, because this is an exciting project to see this building being renovated and reused. Uh, but there's the only these those two items that should be focused on by the commission today. Thank you. And then I'll put this back up to the beginning of the presentation. All right, thank you, Carl. Um, then we would like to welcome the applicant. If you'd like to uh, unmute your mic, announce yourselves, and tell us about your project. My name is Ron Tannenbaum with RDL Architects. Um, we're very excited to be presenting this project today at 1250 Riverbed Street, um, as well as uh, like described uh, the uh, renovation of the area under the Superior Viaduct. Um, so uh, 1250 Riverbed Street is an existing building uh, built in two phases um, a little bit over 100 years ago. One area is a six story building um, and it's sort of you can see it uh, at the top of the page there, um, attaching just to the very end of the Superior Viaduct. And then the other portion is a four-story uh, building, which uh, is a congruent building on the first floor stories, um, but it was built over time um, in the early 1900s. Uh, we, as you can see, we are abutting uh, the Nautica Pavilion, the Jackknife Bridge, uh, the Nautica Powerhouse lot, and um, the Superior Viaduct. It currently does attach to the superior viaduct. I don't know uh, exactly when that attachment uh, occurred, but it seems to have uh, occurred at a very early state uh, in the um, process of the building. Uh, I, I've seen photos in the 1970s of that connection already there, and I have a, a strong feeling that it's existed um, from significantly earlier. Um, the current state of that bridge connector uh, is uh, not quite determined because, uh, as you could have seen from the images before, Mr. Bridges, if maybe you go to the photo that you had uh, shown, uh, there is a overbuild of a wooden uh, deck that had occurred uh, in a more recent time. What we're proposing is to remove that wooded deck and to uh, repair in kind uh, the concrete connector that existed before that. Uh, the primary reason for that is that uh, we would like it to exist in a more original state, as well as uh, that overbuild actually steps up into the building and steps back down onto the viaduct. And we would like to provide a more disabled accessible uh, pathway for people to get up on that sixth floor. Uh, in terms of the upper part of the viaduct, um, we've been uh, working in concert with uh, a lot of the local groups and uh, including Flats Forward. And we don't have any intentions to do anything to the top of the viaduct area. Uh, we are we are hopeful that um, the flats forward district's intention of developing it as a green space um, or as a park type space uh, does come to fruition. Uh, we do not have any intention to park it or do anything like that. Um, but we would like to maintain that connection. Uh, there is parking. Um, uh, down the viaduct, uh, addressing some of the other buildings, and we would like uh, anybody uh, who is up there to have equal access to the offices on that top floor. Uh, the remaining floors, the other five floors, will be residential. We have uh, 70 units planned for the building, um, and uh, it will be accessed from the ground floor as well. 
I think uh, if you look at these top images here, you can see the current state of the underside of the viaduct, which is where we're going to put our main focus and energy of renovation. Uh, we will in we do intend to landscape it uh, in a in an amenity for the actual um, uh, community that we're creating in the building of the 70 residents. Uh, we do intend to create it in a way that um, makes what we believe is the best use of that underside of the arch. And uh, we do not intend to attach or um, do anything to the viaduct itself. Uh, our intention is to just make use of that space in the protected area. I think one thing to note, and you can you can see it a little bit in image K on the upper left, is a large fissure that uh, does exist in the viaduct itself. Uh, when it rains, it, it does run water through it uh, all the way across the viaduct. Um, with that said, uh, what we intend to do is plant it out. And I think that um, for the sake of the commission, we can move a little bit quickly through uh, a lot of these slides. These are some historic images uh, showing the Superior Viaduct um, in its early state. Uh, in the exact center of the page, you can see uh, circa 1940s, uh, the image of the building itself uh, in the viaduct. Uh, on the right, you'll see it at circa 1978 um, and some of these earlier images of the viaduct itself. Um, that we will be uh, sort of working next to. Uh, next slide, please. This is the ground floor uh, in the site plan. Uh, you can see the uh, residences, uh, the main entrance is sort of at the top of the page. And then you can see the viaduct on the left and the park, the sort of uh, amenity space that we're creating. Uh, we'll have better slides of it later, but this is just the overall site plan for context. I think we can move a little bit quicker through uh, some of these residential plans. These are just showing the residential plans. If you go back a few slides, I think there is uh, one thing worth showing. If you go back a few, one more. This is the uh, fifth floor. So this is on the fourth floor roof. Uh, this will be visible from the viaduct. And you can see the left half of the building, we're actually providing an amenity deck. Um, and uh, one thing I want to address for the amenity deck is that it will be visible from people on the viaduct. So we will be uh, dealing with in an, in an understanding of the sort of public nature of that uh, roof deck. It's not um, out of visibility. It's actually highly visible um, from the uh, superior viaduct, viaduct top. Um, in addition to that, we do need to provide egressing uh, for a large space like that. So what you can see on the top of the page there is an L-shaped staircase uh, that will be attaching itself to the bridge portion that's going towards the viaduct. Um, so I wanted to draw your attention to that. Um, and then uh, if we go forward a few slides. Um, uh, yeah. Actually, let's go back one slide. I apologize. Uh, this is the sixth floor office building, and this is showing the attachment um, to the viaduct itself. Uh, we are leaving it uh, with the intent of being as is, although I, I do not believe that it is structurally sound um, and that we will need to be doing repairs to it um, in kind. Uh, our intention is to leave it uh, in in the same uh, vis visual state as po uh, as it is, and once we do demolition, uh, we will be able to uh, evaluate it and address it accordingly. Um, but you see on the left, we do have a man door along that bridge uh, going towards that staircase uh, down to the uh, amenity deck on the floor below, uh, and that will be addressed accordingly. Uh, go forward, please. The ground floor lobby. Uh, this is the existing buildings showing some demolition primarily on the ground floor to add uh, more appropriate uh, windows. Go to the next slide. Uh, you can see the dashed lines showing the demolition of the uh, building on the viaduct side. Uh, this is to add additional windows and provide uh, greater visibility to the viaduct and windows in units uh, to provide uh, daylight. Next slide. I think. We can go through the technical drawings, and I think it's more worth it to uh, show the rendered elevations. Go forward a few slides. This is the uh, river riverbed uh, street facade. Uh, as you can see here, um, we're maintaining uh, the existing building um, in its current state. Uh, even with the windows, uh, we are looking to uh, repair in lieu of replace. Uh, to uh, spend the effort to make sure that it stays in its state, um, in its current state. 
And uh, the other nice thing in this building is that uh, it had been um, sort of kept as an artisan community for a long time, and there was a lot of metal work uh, that went on to balconies um, that are each unique balconies and unique metal work. Unfortunately, those are not structurally sound. Um, but what we did do is actually take those balconies down and we're replacing them uh, onto the facade as an applique along the windows. Um, and we're sort of dancing them across the windows to reference uh, that that sort of artisan past and to make use of that. It's something that we are going to be taking as a theme across the building that we think is um, sort of part of the unique identity of this building and its history, its more recent history. We go to the next slide, please. This is the rear of the building. Uh, you can see the shaded viaduct uh, and all the windows that are now facing it and, um, and sort of have a relationship to the viaduct, um, as well as that entry that you can see at the bottom of the page, uh, which will probably be the main entrance for a lot of the tenants. Uh, they've secured parking at the Nautica Pavilion. Uh, so the tenants would likely be walking in under the viaduct and into the building, which we think um, will sort of enhance that experience um, and the sense of welcome, uh, there is parking along riverbed, so tenants could use that entrance as well. And then I think if you look at the top of the page, you can see the way that we're addressing uh, the uh, viaduct access at the top, um, both in terms of that staircase that goes up to the top, as well as um, a small entrance to the offices um, based on a, uh, an existing opening in the building. And, and that top left, that larger expanse of glass is also an existing opening in the building that we're infilling with glazing. Next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, the building, uh, as you can see, its relationship to the viaduct on the left. Um, this is looking from north, looking south, essentially, uh, from the Nautica Pavilion looking towards the building. This is the dead end of the viaduct. Um, we are adding a sign called the Apollo on the left. Um, and then on the right image, I think uh, what you can see best is that um, attachment along the bridge at the top. And what I'd like to draw attention to is that we are not trying to mimic or copy the railing system along that bridge uh, that exists on the Superior Viaduct. We think it is more appropriate and in better spirit uh, to actually take on that uh, look of the applique on the facade of the 1970s and 80s metalwork um, and sort of look at that dancing pattern uh, as something that can be part of the building. Um, and part of that bridge piece that doesn't uh, interfere with or, or deal with that experience of the uh, railing. One thing I would like to note is um, with that railing, it is a taller railing because we are trying to provide um, protection uh, to keep people from getting down uh, and onto uh, the roof deck. So we are providing a taller um, door height uh, fencing along that area as well. Uh, next slide some of the technical drawings. Uh, this is a, a good sense of the space. Uh, yes, this is the good, uh, sorry, next slide, please. Yes, this is a good sp sense of the space as we intend to improve it under the viaduct. As you can see, it's a landscaped amenity area. We have a lot of different pockets of space here. Um, we have some uh, raised grass areas with uh, a seated bench uh, essentially along it. Um, which would take people from the far side, which is the uh, uh, Jacobs uh, parking area for the uh, powerhouse and Nautica Pavilion, um, and the experience uh, that you can see on the left in terms of the overhang of people walking in. Uh, we need to regrade it a little bit uh, in order to allow for disabled access across this space. Uh, we have a fire pit area where people will be able to hang out under the protection of the viaduct. Uh, we have um, this Tivoli lighting that you see in the middle ground uh, that will also have power along those poles so that people can pull up tables and work and um, use the viaduct to what we think is the maximum experience um, and one of the main unique features uh, of, our, of our building. Next slide, please. This is looking at an evening shot. As you can see here, what we want to do is accentuate the building um, as well as accentuate the viaduct. Uh, so we are providing uh, RGB colored up lighting, uh, which will provide a, a good sense of lighting and a unique lit experience for the viaduct itself um, that would uh, create a draw in the evening times uh, so that residents could use it as well. Uh, we do have a fence essentially where I'm standing along he here in the view. 
uh, that will provide this as a private space. Uh, that fence will have uh, about 20% uh, opacity and 80% porosity within the slats. Um, so it's going to be more open. And the reason for that is to allow for this plant to grow, the plant life here to grow as much as possible. Um, we want to provide as much natural light in here while providing the protection uh, necessary in this area. We don't intend to attach uh, the fencing to the viaduct. We, we intend to come up uh, close to the viaduct without actually attaching to it. Uh, next slide, please. This gives you a sense of that uh, rooftop amenity deck. Uh, this would have visibility uh, from the viaduct itself. Uh, as you can see, we're providing a fireplace here uh, to take advantage and create an outdoor living room again with uh, great views of the city. Uh, this is looking directly down on the water across riverbed and out up towards the bridges. So uh, we're very excited to provide that as amenity to the residents as well as as well as provided as a as a visible element uh, to the viaduct uh, pedestrians. These are uh, some of the interior views, and I think that that uh, would conclude the presentation. This is a, a good uh, landscape view in terms of giving you a sense of the landscaping that's going on underneath it. Thank you for that complete presentation. Um, before I move to design review, just a, one clarification uh, I'll ask prior to local committee's um, feedback. Uh, Carl, you had mentioned that we are reviewing just the connection itself and to the viaduct. Are we also reviewing the uh, landscape below and the design here on the screen, since that is the par parcel of the viaduct? I would believe that that would be the two areas of purview for the Landmarks Commission, yes. But since it's not actually connecting to, they, that's part of what you're looking at. I will add that this was approved by the Planning Commission last Friday and that they would they needed to come here for those parts of it. That's correct. Okay. And design review committee as well. Yes. Okay, perfect. Did we receive any feedback from the local landmark design review? I just went to uh, downtown flats and they approved as presented okay. and uh, with uh, the requirement to come to the landmarks commission for the points that we've discussed. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right, then we will open up the floor to the commission for questions and comments. Who would like to start us off? Ms. Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this is just more information. I I lived in that building in 1983 and 1984. It was a, a legal artist lofts. If if there were it was ever a fire there, there would have been a lot of dead people. Uh, but um, it's an interesting, very storied building. Uh, somebody could write a book about that building and the goings on there. Uh, there were a lot of, Tommy Newman had a lot of parties on that six floor viaduct. Um, there's, it's just a, a fascinating place. Um, I'm curious, this has nothing to do really, but I'm curious how they came up with the name because there's a lot of history attached to that name, to that building. And I'm not sure where the Apollo came from in reference to that. So I know that's kind of off the beaten track here, but I'm just curious. Thank you. To be honest, I'm not clear on the logic behind the name. Um, it's something that the owner has selected and, uh, and we move forward with it. Um, it was very fun actually doing a lot of the research and speaking to people who lived in that building. It has a very unique uh, recent history from, from the 70s to the last few years in terms of the way it was used and uh, the way the building has adapted over time. You are correct. I, I think that uh, the building it was not used in a safe way and uh, we do intend to um, Bring it to use in a in a way that's appropriate and safe, um, while keeping some reference. If if you were there at that time, I think those balconies that that I was referring to with the metalwork were 
either under construction or already there, um, where the artisans had um, done a lot of unique metal work on those railings. The the owner at the time, he did metal sculpture and he put those on, I think in the late eighties. Um, I, I kind of question the value of them and I'm sure they're not installed, you know, to code. Um, but anyway, uh, there's also, there were some structural issues even at the time. I, I know that there was a lot of severe cracking in the north uh, west corner of the building at, at the top. I, I, I would imagine that you would be addressing those kind of issues because I don't think that's ever been um, uh, fixed in the uh, intervening years. So, uh, you know, hopefully you'll be looking at that because it's uh, you know, I, I mean, it probably wouldn't be there if it wasn't for uh, Tommy Newman and, and Joe Scully, but at the same time, you know, there's there's probably a lot to do in that building. But yeah, I was just curious because there's so much history there and, I, you know, the name doesn't seem to reference any of that. And I, you know, I think, it, I don't know, it just, it's going to be hard for me to remember, you know, knowing all that goes on uh, all the going on behind the building and behind the scenes and it was it was just kind of a cool place uh and any feedback on the, 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 the same time but what's that um that is amazing uh history or understanding of the building um do you have any feedback on the design um you know i i think it, it's a, an exciting design um i think you made reference that the viaduct does leak into that space, um, you know, so it, you're probably just aware there's going to be water coming down in there. At least it did. Yeah. I think it still does. Um, we are. We're, we're hoping that, um, you know, this plus all the other projects going on and speaking with plots forward that separate from landmarks that there's a that there's a initiative to do improvements to the viaduct itself. Uh, we don't have any act like we don't have a. We don't have a lease on the viaduct itself. We only have a lease on the land below it. Um, and so we don't have the ability to repair it. And I don't know that we would even know how to appropriately do that. Right. We're hoping that uh, one day in the near future, uh, as this area improves and there's significant investment occurring, we believe already in this area, that there's an initiative to repair it. Um, but in its current state, while it is leaking, it's still such a, an amazing and unique feature in the area that we feel that there's a definite need to take advantage of that space as much as possible. Yeah, that, I'm glad to see that that happening. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Mr. Strickland. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I agree with my fellow Commissioner uh, Michelle Anderson and with the applicant. This is a very exciting project and I commend the developer for saving the structure and the uh, commitment to rehabilitation and redevelopment of this wonderful building along the riverfront and uh, engaging with the superior viaduct and creating that connection uh, i think certainly is commendable and uh, i'm excited to see the project move forward thank you thank you mr strickland mr Edmund. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have a couple couple of my questions are really outside the scope of what we're really reviewing, but I'm going to ask them anyway. Um, the, uh, the metal guardrails, are you able to save and reuse all of them? Because they're non-structural, we're able to save and, and reuse all of them, I would assume. They're essentially an applique. So uh, while they're deteriorated, they're wrought iron, painted black. So we would be able to uh, essentially needed repair, maybe not even repair, just repaint, and then uh, they will just be applied There's essentially. Purely, purely decorative. Correct. Right now they exist as like a three foot balcony, but in order to get out onto that balcony, you have to climb through the middle of the window, um, and that's not appropriate. Um, and so, let alone the structure itself is just bolted on uh, to the facade. So what we're doing is taking off that entire three foot depth and just taking that front panel, <clears throat> excuse me, and, and applying it to the facade. 
and those those windows that it's in front of they don't open out so it's not functioning as any kind of guardrail at all correct they they would not open out it, it's not actually guardrail it's it's a decorative element on the facade at that point um, my second question is about parking. Uh, so I understand you're leasing parking from the uh, powerhouse uh, complex, and I'm, I, am, I do have a little concern that if, if you don't have adequate parking secured there, that this could overwhelm the street parking. Uh, are you confident that you have enough parking full time permanently secured for residents and their guests? Uh, we are, we are in an urban district. And um, based on that, uh, for 70 spots, we're required to actually have 18 dedicated spots to the project itself. Uh, our owner obviously realizes that that's not uh, sustainable in terms of uh, 70 units. So he has secured uh, well above that number, and uh, we've gone through zoning on that. Um, and zoning has approved uh, the parking along there, as well as we're in discussion with uh, the city. Um, and the traffic department to uh, repark uh, angled parking along riverbed, which would add spots along that area as well. So uh, we are confident in the fact that we do exceed that. I would say that um, you know this this area in particular uh, goes through moments of uh, significant stress in terms of street parking when the pavilion is in use. So while it hasn't happened in the last two years, I think that. Um, I'm expecting and hoping that this summer and, and future summers uh, bring it back to its full use. And that would um, essentially entertain moments of uh, extremely high traffic, but I think that's independent of a, a 70 unit building. Okay. And the, the site plan you have, it looks like, is that the, where it shows the 90 degree parking on uh, riverbed, that's the existing condition and where the parking extends beyond the right of way into the park by a few feet. That's, an, that's the existing use. I, mm -hmm. I don't think that that's uh, the intended condition. Okay. So, so the intended condition you said is, is angled parking that would have more spaces, but it wouldn't extend any further into the park than it already does. I don't have an answer to that yet because traffic is working on that. Our intent is not to impact uh, the park. Our intent is to hope that the park is improved. Um, and uh, I, I would just say that that's not our site, and we've provided two options um, to the city. It was it was provided at in December, so it was at a moment of transition. So we don't have closure on that yet, and I I don't want to mislead the mission into thinking that we have um, approvals on that. So I think we're still in talks, and and we did provide two options. One is perpendicular parking. Mm -hmm. Perpendicular parking, if if they choose to go into that that direction would actually uh, probably have a curb stop on the street, but the fronts of the cars would uh, go into the park area. The other one is the angled parking, which I believe is the preferred parking, which would not impact the park at all. And I don't have closure on which way um, we're gonna end up in terms of uh, dealing with the city traffic department on that. Okay. Um, and just, we are working on a design to renovate that park and that's why I'm um, particularly asking about that, and we'll we'll follow up with streets on that. Yeah, I'd like um, to follow up with you on that and streets. I think that you know, it's a riverbed right now is not supposed to. It, I don't believe it was intended to dead end at the Jackknife Bridge, mm -hmm. um, but with the Nautica Pavilion there, we we don't want to impact the flow of traffic through that parking lot um, and force that street to become in use. So what we're trying to do is create a turnaround at the Jackknife Bridge so that we don't impact that area. Um, and we do want to provide adequate parking. And I think that it does make a difference in terms of your question earlier in, in terms of the impact to the area where we provide parking uh, that can, can really, uh, once Heritage Park is improved, allow for use of Heritage Park allow for some of the use for the residents um, and uh, the overall space uh, in general. So I think that that's something worth considering. We do have some diagrams out to the traffic department, which I would be happy to forward to you as well uh, separately that that you can use for your understanding. But I, I don't have closure on that. Um, okay. Um, and then finally, it's a little more directly related to our purview. The, um, the developed landscape area under the arch of the viaduct, uh, that's, uh, you talked about the fence and that's gated. Is that uh, 
accessible only to residents or is that accessible to the public? It would be accessible only to residents. Uh, that's all my questions. Thank it you. would be visible. You can see here the fence. So in terms of the porosity, it would be visible to the residents. And I think um, that area especially gets a lot of evening use, whether it's for the Nautica or um, for other things. And I think that, um, you know, the uplighting of the viaduct and things like that would also emanate a glow that would provide some sense of presence, uh, but it would not be actually physically accessible to the public. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Edmund. Um, I'm going to interject my comments now. I, I think this is a very um, creative and thoughtful way to try to engage this you know, beautiful um, you know, element within uh, this environment and allow it to interact with the building. Um, I really do like the landscaping design and um, the fencing. Um, could you, did, Carl, could you fast or could you forward to that elevation again? Of the fencing. Last page. So you have brick piers, and what are the materiality of the um, slats? Uh, painted aluminum. So they would be painted black. And again, um, you can see how they're dancing back and forth in the spirit of um, the sort of metalwork, the artisan metalwork uh, that had occurred on the front facade. So instead of keeping it regular, it's also, um, we think, a way to visually break up. The overall um, division and not make it feel like a long barrier. Um, so by adding that visual interest, I think that it brings a more human scale to the actual fence and doesn't um, make it feel so monolithic. I think the monolithic element is the viaduct, and we don't want to compete with that. So I think that it, it's a play on scale uh, as well as a reference to the building itself. And what's the height of the fence? Sorry, what's the height? Uh, if we can zoom in there. Oh, we can't the zoom, in, but uh, I think we can personally. I just thought, sorry, I was lazy. I guess I could have asked. Um, I can't read it on my screen. Six foot six. Is that right? That's correct. I'm sorry, I don't remember it off the top of my head, but it, it should be about human scale. We're we're trying to keep people from jumping over the fence, um, and. I'm fighting that line of, of that as well as providing as much openness. We're, we're north facing and the building is so close to the viaduct. I'm, I'm fighting for natural light. So, so six foot six to the top of the pier and six foot oh to the top of the metal. That's... Got it. Perfect. Thank you. And would that same height and configuration, since it was small on the screen, be um, the portion that you said you were replacing where we're creating that new connection to the bridge from the viaduct to the building? That would be slightly taller. That would be six foot eight. Okay. Um, I don't mind the height of it. I just wonder how that fits in with the very delicate, you know, um, railing that is existing on the viaduct. Um, I would encourage you to just look at the um, design of that gate because I think you know, and having something that may be a little bit more delicate, but uh, refined for that connection point uh, would be more uh, appropriate since it's connected more to the top of the viaducts than it is to the balconies that are on the opposite side of the building or below. You know, that has its own is standing. That it's becoming its own element to extend it you know, to the other side of the uh, viaduct. But I think this one to me feels like it may want to be uh, more delicate because um, you know, it, how it is going to be prominent in, you know, the four or background like it is in this rendering. So I, I can restudy that to provide, I think by delicate, I think maybe a little bit more open. Um, more open. Yes. Like the railings that you see on top of the viaduct. So it's not a dominant feature, you know, within, you know, the, uh, um, within the, the view shot, like you see here. Yeah, and I think, um, Mr. Bridges, I think you have uh, some earlier images of the viaduct itself and its existing conditions. One thing I would say is that, um, you know, this is fall protection up here. So while sure. uh, this is a nice open railing, uh, we do need to maintain uh, the sort of code-driven minimum spacing or maximum spacing between 
the elements itself. So I think we'll restudy that to provide it um, to, to be as open as possible between those slats within code. And I think that you can see that half of this, besides the ornamental arched sort of top half, the lower half and, and the breakdown of, of the sort of pattern uh, would be in the spirit of a lot of the same as the metalwork itself on the facade. I, I think that we can uh, look at that to, to provide that same openness and maybe a thinner rail um, or a thinner style to go with that in terms of the overall look. I think we can do that very easily. And if you can see here, I think also the six foot eight is, is intended to align with the top of the doorway um, so that uh, we have a tie into the building itself in terms of a datum line that doesn't just miss by two inches or look like a mistake. Sure. No, I appreciate that. And I think a more open um, railing to relate you know, to you know, the existing um, is exactly what I was looking for. So thank you. Mr. Buenazzi, questions or comments? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, considering I can see this from my desk. Um, Carl, could you actually go down? We we're just at it, the rendered elevation of this connection point. And it was also about this gate that I have a slight um, I'm not going to admit morbid, but concern. Yes, right here. So I know that you can't zoom in, Carl. But if we zoom in and we think about the way that this gate is working, we have the six foot eight coming to meet the viaduct. Um, but if I looked beyond the gate, like say I'm standing at the railing across from me, yes, there's like I'm assuming two or three feet, but then there's another low railing. And so my concern is that some very adventurous people late at night who have been drinking at Luca might come down to the end of the viaduct and think, oh, if I could just jump, I could get down onto that roof deck space. So my initial, my, my first initial thought is that what if that six foot eight wrapped to enclose your kind of landing that goes down to the roof? And then you could have a more like, you know, three foot thing, three foot railing that comes to meet that. Um, that way you wouldn't, right, there's absolutely no possibility of getting onto that landing for anyone from the viaduct. I know that that seems like you know, a bit advantageous of like who's going to jump over there, but I have I've seen stupid people. Um, and that'd be my first concern. And I think it would also resolve kind of this like detailed connection of the six foot eight coming to meet the lower um, part of the viaduct, because instead the six foot eight would wrap and then the three foot would come and basically terminate into it. I think kind of that study of those um, elevations of things, because my first thought of that was just a big safety concern of does that make sense? It's hard to do it without like drawing and. It does. It's it's. I think the image is a little bit misleading, unfortunately. It, so there's an angle between the viaduct and the building. So when we drew these elevations, in order to get the head-on elevation, um, mm -hmm. it's not really revealing the gap. If you look at the air gap by the bridge. Um, that's the air gap that's in between the viaduct. So somebody climbing that edge of the viaduct and theoretically jumping over would be jumping over, yeah, would be some significant parkour going on to go and jump across. <laughs> um, not to say that it's impossible, but it, it would be um, incredibly dangerous. I think that's something, uh, depending on the use of the viaduct, Overall, I think that's something of a consideration because of the railing and and the drop around the viaduct. But uh, we can look at maybe creating a return. I just didn't want to compete. I was I was very concerned about competing or installing anything on the viaduct itself. So if I install a return, that, that return would be installed on the viaduct itself. We were trying to avoid installing anything on that. Mm -hmm. uh, well. I more so meant the return would be on on your kind of platform that you're creating because right the, now on the flat yeah we could do that because right now when you return you're going back down to like a three foot railing yes if that makes sense so if that return was the six eight there'd be no chance of me like right absolutely no way i could get onto that yeah we could do that okay that'd be fantastic you're saying, uh, Jonathan, on the image on the left, where you can see the new stair platform coming up to meet the existing you know, bridge, having it the six foot eight really just be the area that's related to that platform, and then it would transition down to the three foot to hit, you know, to join to the viaduct three foot round. Correct. Or exactly. Inch. 
Correct. And then when you see that six foot eight, you know, return and go onto the new platform, because it, you'd be faced with six foot eight, if I'm standing on the viaduct, there's no chance yeah. that I could, you know, get across onto that platform. And then I think it would also resolve this kind of like six foot eight meeting the three foot of the viaduct. Yeah, I agree. Just to be clear, there's, there's a separation there. So we're not attaching that turn. We're just providing enough turn. So there's still a gap between that area that you're noting and the viaduct. So somebody would still have to jump across an open space to mm -hmm. get onto that. Yeah. We'll go back I to the six floor plan. It was probably the most visible at that point. Yeah. But our intent is, you know, if you look at where that missing slat is, I think that's a good approximation of where the landing would end. Turns, mm -hmm. yep. turns there. So somebody would still have to jump across that gap. Um, but we could provide a taller fence there. I don't know that it would be actual protection, but we could we could study installing that uh, over there because I think somebody would still be over six stories of empty space there. Well, I think what Mr. Benazi is saying, and I would agree, is that this is a great illustration of it. Is that you know how that uh, new six foot eight fence will um, connect and interact with the existing rail that in the photograph on the left, yeah. it, it's going to feel awkward, you know, that transition where if you are able to uh, lower that area from the existing fence over to that um, slab that is uh, missing, you know, it's a better resolution and, and does provide you know, a little bit of breath for the viaduct versus this new uh -huh. um, element. I'm sorry, I misunderstood you. Now I understand what you're saying. I, I apologize. So I'm, I'm basically going to create a wrapper around that top landing instead of a straight wall extending out. Exactly. Yes. I apologize. I was, I was misunderstanding your comment. Oh, it's, it's, I, it's one of the many troubles and tribulations I found that you have to describe in words what you want to do with a pen. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I, I see now what you're saying. Yeah, we can absolutely wrap the landing and then um, I think bring the railing at, at a you know 42 inch height across to meet that existing railing, which would be the let's say the new pattern. Um, but then it would interact at the same height as the railing and provide that relationship. And that would be the same if you look at the in the distance where it's it's a, just the railing across the bridge, it would mat, match that as well then. Mm -hmm. Yes, we can absolutely do that. Thank you. I, I apologize for misunderstanding. No, that's no it, it took a lot of like reading of the drawings, <laughs> like try to be happy you put that image up, <laughs> bring this up. Um, but no, thank you. Glad we're all on the same page. Miss Anderson, did you have an additional comment? Yes, I do. Thank you so much. Um, this is regarding the lower level where the residents will be entering through that. Um, area underneath the viaduct. I was just wondering what um, kind of measures you are taking for uh, security in that area. Uh, you know, just uh, lighting cameras. Uh, if, if you have any uh, thing to share on on that, thank you. So we do have we do have lighting. Um, I think that our intent is that uh, that fence line at the the top of the page here would uh, add the secure zone um, where it would be a, a man, or not a man door, but a, um, a card reader door um, where tenants would be able to enter into there. Uh, and then they would have a card reader again to get into the building. Um, the gap on the right, um, which has a trash corral and sort of off to the corner will be fenced as well. Um, and that's the back of house area. And um, so I don't believe that there will be ability to enter for tenants in that area. Uh, so I think that our perspective on this is that it would, the underside of the viaduct would be a secure area in that regard. Um, anything beyond that security wise would be uh, low voltage cameras, things like that, and not uh, human security at this point in terms of the intent of the owner. Thank you. With that, I see no additional questions or comments. Would someone like to make a motion? Mr. Panazzi. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I put forward 
that we approve as presented given the um, committee's comments and conditions regarding the connection point and wrapping the landing at the top. I don't believe there was any um, conditions on the landscape, but I might have just missed it, so I just wanted to address that. Um, but that is my uh, losing my words. Thank you for the motion with yeah. the one condition. Motion. I forgot the word motion. Do we have a second? Mr. Edmond? I'll second that motion. Thank you. Any further discussion? Okay, Mr. Pettit, please call roll and announce the results. Ms. Anderson? Yes. Mr. Bonazzi? Yes. Mr. Dreyer? Yes. Mr. Edmund? Yes. Mr. Strickland? Yes. Mr. Tarasic? Yes. Ms. Trott? Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Excellent. Um, very much. Thank you. We look forward to seeing your project move forward. Have a good day. Thank you, you too. We're now going to move back to our fifth applicant, the solar panel installation at uh, the Stewart residence located at 13519 Corby Road. I'd like to welcome the applicant to uh, announce themselves and tell us about your project. Excellent. For housekeeping, um, da, uh, I'm sorry, Carl controls your slides, so please tell him when you'd like to advance. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Ace, and I am here to represent the project. We are looking to install uh, 14 solar panels on the front of this home, um, as well as two. So it's 12 in front, two in back. Um, just because of how the sunlight comes in, that is why we're looking to install them on the front, that we do believe that the trees help to hide them. Um, all projects that we do are installed as neatly as possible. Conduits are ran through the roof in order to keep them not visible, and then they will come out of the roof on the side of the home near the, the main panel in order to connect. Um, in the past, we have painted those uh, the conduits in order to further hide them, make them less visible, and match them to the side of the home. Um, all panels, like I said, are installed as close to the top as we can get just to keep them out of sight, out of mind. Does that conclude your um, presentation? Yes, it does. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, was there a feedback from the local design review committee? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this was reviewed by the Shaker Square Design Review Committee on March 15th. They approved it as presented uh, there, and it was based on they're feeling that this particular it's appropriate for this particular house. Uh, they felt that the roof is a secondary element. It's this house isn't like some of the other Tudor residences in the neighborhood. Uh, it's also very much blocked by the view is blocked by trees, and they felt that the impact would be minimal. Uh, so they fully support the project. Uh, I think it's worth noting. Uh, just for the commission's reference that the last case, the last solar case we reviewed, uh, on West, uh, 32nd street was appealed by the applicant and the, uh, the, uh, board of zoning appeals determined that the commission was arbitrary and capricious. So they overturned our decision. Uh, I would also note though, that. I think our, the commission's issue wasn't really so much with solar installation as it was with the material of the roof that was being proposed. So, and we, we should have, some, we should have a further discussion at some point about uh, how we address solar panels moving forward. Uh, I just wanted the commission to be aware of that, but the uh, design review committee fully supports this installation in this location. 
Thank you. Uh, we will then open the floor for the commission for questions and comments. Who would like to start us off? Ms. Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the rendering here, um, it doesn't really show exactly what these uh, units are going to look like on the roof, but um, the presenter mentioned that the um, solar panels would be higher up on the roof uh, where the rendering here shows them pretty much covering uh, that roof. I, I just wanted to get some clarification on uh, on that. Thank you. Yes, of course. Uh, so it's it's usually very hard to properly display how high up we get these panels on um, just like overhead views like this, um, depending on when we get there, how we can actually compare what size the roof is compared to the panel size. We'll put them as high up as possible. They may come down just a little bit lower, but it is always our goal to get them as out of view as we possibly can. What are they? The solar panels are black. Usually that's what I see. Is that correct? Correct. Yes, we use completely black solar panels. I mean, it, it's not a great look, but I can understand why people want to install them. It's a uh, you know, worthy goal to um, have renewable energy. And, uh, you know, at, at some point, if the technology changes, these are removable, correct? Correct. Yes, all panels are removable. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Um, I will ask my questions since I don't see any additional questions right now. Uh, will the roof be replaced with this installation? I know typically, typically that's a requirement for the panel. No, we have determined that our, our engineer went through and double checked it and they determined that the roof should be all right to withstand the panels. Um, we can definitely have it double checked as well, but we've determined that a, a roof installation will not be necessary. Okay. Um, that's interesting. Um, so it's a, it's a new roof. Is that what you're saying? A fairly new roof. That's why. Yes. Um, did that come in front of us before Carl or Don? No. It, uh, Madam chair, it would have been an administrative approval. Uh, so it wouldn't okay. have gone to the commission, but I, we'd have to check the record to see when it was actually installed and approved by us. Okay, no worries. Just a question. Um, just because obviously with the red roof and the black panels, it's be, uh, going to become uh, very visible or with a different color uh, roof, like a black or a gray it would be uh, less, you know, contrast between the, the new installation. Um, other questions or comments? Other questions or comments from the commission? Would someone like to make uh, a motion? Someone like to make a motion? Oh, am I frozen on my side? No, looks like Ms. Anderson. someone from the commission like to make a motion? I cannot. I, I guess I'll, I will motion, move to approve as presented. Uh, I mean, I have some concerns, but I, you know, again, this is something that is not 100% permanent and uh, you know, they only the only stipulation I would have is if they go to replace the roof at some point, which if it's fairly new, we're probably looking at a couple of decades down the line, that if the panels are there, maybe we should they should consider uh, matching the color of the roof to make the um, 
panels less obvious, but if the roof is new, I, I don't know whether I want to tell them to replace it. So that's the, that's my motion. Sorry, it's so complicated. So you have a motion with the um, recommendation, but not the requirements to consider changing the roof at color. And when they uh, do go to a roof replacement, I, I think at the point where they have to replace the roof. Yes, I think the color should um, be more consistent with the panels so that the panels don't um, jump out the way they're probably going to at this point. Okay, thank you for that motion. Do we have a second? Mr. Edmund? I'll second that motion. Thank you for the second. Further discussion? The only thing I would add is, and I'm sorry, I left it out of my comments, is that I think we do encourage people to you know, move towards a more sustainable approach. And I think this is it. And it's always that delicate balance in historic districts to get the technology to work with the um, historical aesthetic. That's more commentary. Any further discussion? Uh, Mr. Pettit, please call roll and announce the results. Ms. Anderson. Yes. Mr. Bonazzi. Yes. Mr. Dreyer. Yes. Mr. Edmund. Yes. Mr. Strickland. Yes. Mr. Tarasic. Yes. Ms. Trott. Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Excellent. Thank you for the presentation. Look, uh, good luck with your project. Thank you so much and thank you for your time. Thank you. That concludes our uh, certificates of appropriateness. We'll mo now move on to concept plan review. Just to remind the board, this will be for review and feedback only. We will not be taking a vote. Um, we will begin with the uh, lobby renovation and elevator addition located at the former Agglomated Clothing Workers of America, now the Norm Norma Her Women's Center located at 2227 Payne Avenue. Hey, Madam Chair and Commission members, uh, this is Brian Grambort with Heedy D. Francisco and Siebold or the architect for this project. Um, move to the next slide. Um, as mentioned, I'll be presenting the Norma Her Women's Center. We are doing uh, some limited rehabilitation repairs uh, on the front of the historic um, Sydney Hillman Memorial Building, which is now over her, as well as an elevator addition on the rear of the building. What you see here is the, the current um, front elevation along Payne Avenue on the right with the striking con, uh, concave form, two-story form, and the two-story glass block is the um, historic Sydney Hillman Memorial Building, which was the Amalgamated Clothing Workers of America Union headquarters. Um, built in 1949, um, and I believe that union uh, left the building in 1999, so 50 years later, 2004, um, I believe it was the YWCA uh, started uh, Norma Her Women's Center Emergency Women's Shelter in this location, um, along with the structure on the left, which was the old Fox and Film Building. Unfortunately, I don't have much uh, historic information on that structure. Um, but then the two structures were joined in 2010 um, with a, a link building, which we'll see later on. Um, next slide, please. Site plan showing the parcel uh, off the north side of Payne Avenue um, between East 22nd and 23rd. And I'll go through some context images briefly here in the next few slides. Um, the uh, mostly nondescript fraternal order of police immediately to the east on Payne Avenue. The next slide across East 23rd is the Cleveland um, Credit Police Credit Union. Moving to the west on the next slide is the empty parking lot, somewhat in disuse. And then following that, the Campus International School south across Payne Avenue. And the last slide, uh, parking lots immediately south across Payne Avenue. Um, so the, the 
photo on the top right is the historic elevation uh, prior to any repairs or modernization. You see the two-story glass block uh, still um, evident. Uh, there was a symmetrical um, stair and railing along the, the front that you see um, in the photo below uh, was uh, after the renovations, after uh, it became the Norma Her Women's Center. Um, you can see uh, an accessible ramp was installed on the left side, uh, creating kind of an asymmetry. Um, and then the 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 um, equal paired uh, entrances, the three entrances at the first floor of the three center bays of the glass block were replaced to provide accessible entrances, uh, one on either side of a fixed center panel. At that time, uh, I believe um, exterior wall sconces had been approved and installed. Uh, you see in the bottom right hand photo kind of matching that clear anodized aluminum storefront finish. And then the existing uh, elevation on the left is where we are today. Uh, those wall sconces had subsequently been replaced with what we believe uh, the intent was to provide a tamper-proof fixture. Um, and the doors uh, have been replaced with uh, painted hollow metal black. <clears throat> um, the first scope item, if we can move to the next slide, is uh, the glass block. Um, glass block uh, is still fixed in place, but we're, uh, the building is getting uh, quite a bit of moisture infiltration, damaging some of the historic uh, interior terrazzo um, down into the basement. And so our, our proposal is to remove and replace the existing um, fluted glass block uh, with new uh, glass block. Um, the existing installation, as you see on the right two photos, is a quarter turn uh, installation. These are eight by eight by four inch glass block. <clears throat> in subsequent uh, discussions with Sevis, which is a local nationwide glass block manufacturer, uh, we have a, a matching glass block. These existing blocks have 10 uh, flutes on them. It's not fabricated any longer. Uh, the, the proposed replacement glass block has 12 flutes. Um, and there are, have already been some replacement where some of the blocks have been damaged. Um, those replacement blocks have, have already been installed. Um, so it's our intention to use uh, what's as close uh, as closely matching um, glass block as possible in that same quarter turn installation. Next slide, please. Um, the second item uh, of repair uh, rehab is to the front um, openings. So you see the original image on the, the top right, again, the, the kind of the equal paneled door openings, all three of those were functional. Um, and then on the bottom left, we have kind of, uh, an asymmetrical orientation uh, door, uh, uh, three, three foot wide by seven foot tall hollow metal doors with a smaller side light. Um, our intention is to maintain the equal uh, divided light in the center fixed, um, but then and on the right hand side maintain a three foot accessible door with a smaller side light, but then mirror that image to the left hand side. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. Our intention also is to uh, remove the the clear anodized aluminum frames and header and use uh, an impact resistant stainless steel door. And the, and the intention is to use a colored stainless steel um, that harkens back to the original bronze finish. It, it, right now, what we're trying to do is, is to coordinate the, the color of the doors and the frame, as well as the new wall sconces, which you'll see in the next slide, uh, so that those metal finishes uh, match and are closer to um, the original bronze finish uh, of the doors as well as the the stone that you see here the the champagne color in the middle is what we had originally selected clearly the um, we feel that the image that's provided by the manufacturer is is quite metallic um, and so we are in the process of of getting physical samples to look at to again try to match um, the wall sconces to the doors and frames 
The next slide, please, is an image of our proposed wall sconce. Uh, we're looking to go back to a fixture or to go to a fixture that would emphasize kind of the verticality of these pilasters it would be an up and down, up down LED fixture. Um, and it would be in a bronze finish again, trying to match um, match the the color of the the doors and the frames, um, which we are in the process of. The next slide shows uh, on the right hand uh, two existing photos of the deteriorated uh, steps and the platform up to the front entrances. Uh, the flagstone is suffering from a lot of moisture infiltration, the freeze and thaw. Uh, and um, as I mentioned, a uh, glass block allowing moisture inside uh, the basement um, is a full basement that, that matches the curve of this uh, front facade. And uh, there's a lot of moisture getting down there. So our, our proposal is to remove the flagstone, um, salvage, the uh, railing which you see kind of on the left hand side of the bottom right photo the original bronze handrail and railing um, salvage that for reinstallation but remove the flagstone platform and steps provide new waterproofing uh, and come back with a new concrete um, platform and uh, steps with uh, stone um, stone facing along that exposed uh, vertical vertical plane Next slide. Um, with the addition of the ramp, which you see on the left hand um, plan, um, the function of the shelter uh, per, is, is certainly as a shelter, uh, but also provides um, some food. And uh, there's a lot of eating and um, uh, pedestrians hanging out uh, and, and some of the residents in this front area. Uh, and so we're, we're providing, uh, we wanna provide some fixed trash receptacles to uh, encourage use of them um, as, as uh, the trash can get quite, um, can, can compile. Next slide, please. So this is a, an interior floor plan. Um, and on the right, the uh, photo of the, the existing uh, vestibule with the historic terrazzo floor. Uh, our intention is to, as you see in the photo on the right, uh, it's a fairly open vestibule, um, kind of a free floating um, reception desk um, and metal detector. Our intention uh, directed by the owner is to provide a secured entry vestibule and an enclosed reception desk. Um, we're not, uh, we're, lightly touching the terrazzo and doing some repairs uh, where it is being exposed, um, but not affecting any of the, the fenestration, the glass block openings. Uh, next slide, please. On the right is the existing uh, whole floor plan. So the historic Sydney Hillman Memorial Building on the top, and then the Fox and Film structure on the bottom. Uh, you, you can see the connector in between um, just inside the, the courtyard. Uh, our addition, um, elevator addition, is going inside the courtyard, so we're not taking over any of the existing occupied space. And you see on the top left is a clipped image of that plan with the connector still in place in gray and a, a new elevator hoistway and one uh, full service, so it'll, it'll serve both the basement, first floor, and the second floor, um, as well as a one-story <clears throat> elevator lobby. Um, you see in the uh, one item to note is in the existing plan in that link, at the top of the link, um, there are steps and an existing lift. Uh, the two first floor elevations are um, off by approximately 30 inches. So this elevator will provide full accessibility to both structures. Um, if we go to the next slide, we'll see uh, photos on the left and right. Uh, of the link and the two structures. So we're in, in that rear courtyard. Um, the hoistway will be installed on the left and it will be not taller than the existing Norma per building. Um, its intention is to be um, uh, faced with uh, materials that will match the existing link. So we don't want to um, match the existing building since this is a new structure. We're uh, 
trying to keep in kind with um, the non-historic portion of, of the building. Um, and then the one story portion of the elevator lobby across the face of, of this will essentially cover the, the lighter beige brick that you see in these photos. Um, and our intention is to match that brick, which is shown on the next elevation, or I'm sorry, the next slide. Um, that is the summary of, of the project. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, we'll start off with uh, feedback from the local design review committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this was reviewed by the Downtown Flats Design Review Committee on the 17th. Uh, they asked for, they supported this project, but they had asked for a better rendered front elevation. They asked for the consistent metals. There had been three different metal colors um, proposed, but they wanted consistent metals on the front of the building and uh, more consistent lines and delineation of the styles, rails, and frames um, in regard. So they were in support. They uh, approved this conceptually, and it needs to go back to them after review here. Okay, thank you. Um, we will then open up the floor to the commission for questions and comments. Who would like to start us off? Mr. Admin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yeah, we also wanted to comment on the metals, and I, I realize you're trying to you're you are making an effort to to match. And I was just wondering, I assume the uh, wall sconces are um, aluminum, and if if they're colored, then it's an anodized color. Is that correct? Uh, yes, that 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 would so, be correct. It would be a colored color. Wouldn't it? Wouldn't you have a better chance of matching that if your doors were also aluminum? Canada, or is that not? A that's that's the struggle right now. Is is trying to find um, if we can find uh, matching colors, uh, we would prefer to use um, the impact resistant stainless steel. These doors receive, I mean, they receive a lot of use and, and a lot of wear. Um, uh, anodized, I'm sorry, uh, aluminum doors um, have, have, will will well, our fears they will get beaten up. Yeah. Yeah, and the um, the door elevations. So you're keeping single leaf on the two sides and the double leaf in the center, looking at the plan. But the would the elevations of the doors be similar to what they are now, or sort of more similar to the historic photo? But keeping in mind that it's one leaf on the sides. Sure. Our our intention is to use a medium style uh, doors, so similar to what is existing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one of the design review comments was uh, these new doors will have a 10 inch bottom rail for accessibility uh, to comply with accessibility requirements um, at the side lights in those door openings, as well as the center equal paired um, opening. We're going to match that 10 inch uh, bottom rail. Um, so uh, it, it is. It, it'll be similar, I think, to the original, but it, the intention is to use a medium style door. Okay. And the final comment, and realizing this this may be difficult, or uh, but I wonder, you know, the, in the interior lobby, that um, concentric circle motif is so dominant yeah. uh, in the exterior and the interior. Is there any opportunity to incorporate that into the design of the reception desk, or or is that just not really feasible? Um, the the reception desk and the vestibule is primarily determined by um, the function um, we were we had explored some additional options um, but the size and uh, orientation of it um, the the management the why have certain requirements for uh, people coming in and uh, how much space is required and what form that needs to take in addition to some of the elements um, I think you see uh, in the photo, a lock box that has to be um, provided uh, accessible by the police. Mm -hmm. uh, so th the form we would like to, we, we originally had some other options, um, but this one was preferred by property management based on their function, so. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Edmund. Other questions or comments from the commission?
I will state mine right now. I would agree with, or echo what Mr. Edmund said about the extra of the building. I think um, the consistency of metals would be key. You know, this is such a um, uh, unique building um, try, that is very simple that you know, if you're going to use stainless, I use stainless everywhere um, for the lights and or an anodized aluminum or aluminum paint to try to emulate the stainless uh, or like a Kynar finish on you know, the aluminum so that uh, it, it can um, emulate the stainless finish. Right now, um, I believe by by accident you said they would be um, bronze light fixtures, and you know, you, you can all see that how the uh, light current light fixtures in that type of finish really stand out. Where the original light fixtures um, from the photos we showed earlier were very background and really let the structure um, stand out versus the fixtures themselves. Agreed. Other, I have no um, comment or no um, objection to the elevator addition. Ms. Anderson? Just a quick comment. Um, with the existing railing, I, I would not want to eliminate that and replace it with aluminum. Uh, I, even though it may not be consistent with the color, I would want to retain the existing railing. It's it's very elegant and it's beautiful and it is an original part of the building. And, and that is our intention. Um, we would like, we're planning to salvage the existing railing as we go through and do that waterproofing um, and then reinstall that railing. Any other questions with Sanderson or comments? No, I I would imagine the original doors were probably scrapped a long time ago. They were probably pretty substantial and durable, but they're probably not around. So we'll have to um, utilize the uh, the doors suggested by the applicant. Um, and I I I'm fine with the addition of the elevator. Those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Other questions or comments from the commission? Would someone like to put forward a motion? Madam Chair, this is a concept review only. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Is there any other questions or comments from uh, the commission? Just got on my train, Carl. Um, since this is a concept plan review, uh, we will not be taking a vote. Does the applicant feel like you've received enough feedback to continue your development? I do. Okay, thank you. We look forward to seeing you uh, in the near future with your final presentation. Thank you. Have a good thank day. Thank you. You too. We'll move on to our next applicant. Um, uh, Case Western South Residential Campus, Murray Hill Road, new construction of student residence houses or student residence phase one and two. Good morning, Madam Chair and board members. Um, my name is Chris Paniki. I'm the director of planning, design, and construction at the university. I'm very pleased to present this project um, for you today. It went on hold during the pandemic, so we're very anxious to get it, get it moving. Um, I'm going to introduce the presenters, the main presenters for today. But before I do that, I just wanted to say two things. The reason why we're doing this project is really um, to provide housing for our second year students who reside on the south side. Our student population is growing. And we need to accommodate their needs as well as enhance their uh, student experience. So I'd like to introduce the presenters. Um, um, Joanne Brown, Assistant Director from the Case Western Reserve University. Um, Sidney Meyer, the lead architect from William Ron Associates, as well as Ryan Hogan, um, project architect. That being said, I'm going to turn it over to Joanne. Okay, great. Uh, if we could have the next slide. Uh, basically, we're going to talk about uh, three things. We've already done the project introduction, schedule, zoning, and parking approach. Uh, it will be a tag team with myself and Sindhu. Uh, we'll go right through that. Uh, next slide. So right now, as Chris had mentioned, um, 
this is housing for our second year students. We do have an increased population. And what this slide is showing you are the two areas. The South Residential Village is shown in the yellow circle. And then at the top of the screen, um, there's the Residential Village. Uh, and currently our students are split. Um, per our, our pedagogy, both uh, uh, in the in the student life, we really like to keep keep the second year students together. So you'll see, as indicated in um, our schedule, and as Chris mentioned, we really are anxious to get this going. Next slide. This is just a little bit of a blow up. This is showing the actual site where we're looking to put these two buildings. This is currently a parking lot, and it is adjacent to our south um, dining hall as well as um, residence halls and some Greek life housing. Next slide. This is really just to indicate, uh, this slide's from our master plan that we re did in 2015. And this is showing the phase one and phase two, the two buildings of 600 beds. And uh, just indicating that uh, this is something that has been uh, planned and we are uh, working with uh, the same thought process of our uh, master planning effort. We do have two buildings um, that house the beds and uh, one is called the Murray Building and the other is called the Hill Building uh, for purposes right now. Next slide. Again, our goal, 600 beds, this will uh, accommodate our new student population and opening in the fall of 2024. Next slide. This just describes that project schedule a little more. <clears throat> Excuse me. You can see that we did start this project back in 2020, and we did have that delay or that shutdown uh, during the, the COVID pandemic. We have now re-engaged. We're looking to uh, get construction started as soon as possible uh, this year, and then uh, a move in after a 24-month build-out period. There are some early packages enabling a lot of that deals with getting uh, utilities to the site. Next slide. With this, I'll turn it over to Sindhu who can walk you through more of the architectural elements. Thank you, Joanne. I just wanted to uh, remind everyone we've had a couple of uh, meetings with various members of this group. So uh, I apologize if any of this is repetitive for you, but we wanted to go through the whole process. We met with you in January 2020 and showed you this layout for the two buildings. The building on the top of the page is the Murray building and the building on the bottom is the Hill building. And one of the comments we received from your group was that the massing of the Murray building was a little overwhelming for the street. So we took your advice and on the next slide, we came back more recently in February to show you a revised layout where we took that wing of the building and put it onto the hill building, which sits back from Murray Hill. And that allowed us to reduce the scale and massing of the Murray Hill building. And I think it is a positive move for the project. Before we move on from this slide, I just want to let you know that we have been engaging with Jennifer Kipp and working on the tree preservation plan. Uh, Overall, we will be removing some trees, but we will be replacing uh, every tree we do take down, we will be replacing with two, two trees by the end of this design process. We can go to the next slide. These are, I'll just walk you through the plans. At, on the ground floor by Murray Hill, we have put the most public elements to welcome people into this new district for the second years. So the purple area is the multi-purpose room and, um, and wellness center. And then you'll see the four arrows along Murray Hill. Those are the four apartments for the adults and their families who are living on this in this building. And they will be um, the good neighbors to the rest of the street. And so we've designed this part of the building and you'll see it in the elevations and renderings to be more residential scale with porches and front doors to react and reflect the um, character of the neighborhood. Next slide. 
these are um, more of the typical floors. You can see the blues are the bedrooms. They're primarily a set of doubles with a couple of singles for the RAs and our ADA requirements. The purple areas are the common spaces and gray are more of the mechanical functions. Next slide. And here is the upper floors. Um, again, they start to repeat with the layout of the bedrooms and common spaces. Next slide. When we were designing this building, we started with the existing context. And like Joanne said, we, you recently, they recently refurbished the Fribley building. And so we took some of the uh, language of Fribley. We also um, were very aware of the hill and the landscape that you do have along Murray, along with the brick road um, in historical um, Little Italy. Next slide. And then we did walk up and down um, Little Italy and study the neighborhood and the scale and the materiality that is being used currently in that area and our neighbors. Next slide. We also studied the newer construction in the area and noted how many of these buildings, while a little bigger, um, tried to break down the scale using materials and massing. Next slide. And our um, neighbor to the south is Fribley, and you will see the glazing and the mullion color, as well as the wood overhang. We brought some of those elements into our building, as well as the undulating roof. We took it and spun it and made it our undulating elevation. So in general, here's our first elevation of the building we designed, and uh, we worked hard to keep it at a pedestrian and neighborhood level um, by bringing down the first the front of the building we've made it four stories and set back the taller portion of the building to the um, quad side or to the east and so um, you can see the building heights on the right and the glassed glass glazed area on the right is the multi-purpose room and along the ground floor you'll see the four apartments with their four front doors and we can show you the porches in the rendering a little better. So here's our first rendering. Um, we did take, um, we met with a group of this, um, this um, cohort here and we did get some feedback about making sure that even though we did set back the red brick taller volume that we should make sure we define it and punctuate it with glazing to make sure it's not too um, too utilitarian in elevation. And so we've taken those comments and you'll see some of that here. Next slide. But when you stand on the street across from, um, across from our building, you'll notice that the red brick re recedes. And so the scale of the building is more in keeping with what you see on the rest of Murray, a four-story building that's broken up in massing with glazing as well as our undulating brick. And then we kept the lower level with stone and started defining the front doors with those porches for the individual apartments. And here's an example of one of those porches. And it is our hope and Case Western's hope that these four apartments will uh, and their residents will uh, fit right in with the neighbors across the way. Next slide. This is an image um, from a Delbert Bridge looking at the multi-purpose room. Okay, great. Um, now we're going to talk a little bit about zoning and parking. So if we go to the next slide, what you see shown in yellow is the actual site. Uh, the university is in the process of a, a parcel consolidation plat. Um, but what you'll notice is there are three different zoning districts that surround the space right now. There's an MFC1, an MFD2, uh, and an MFE3. Uh, C1 is the most restrictive regarding square footage and height. Uh, that is what the site and all those parcels currently are zoned. Uh, we have been in conversations with the city as well as um, 
folks in planning. Uh, we're working closely with uh, Shannon Leonard and zoning as well regarding um, looking at a potential rezoning and a map amendment. And we would like to move to an MFD2 district. Next slide. And one of the reasons for this is uh, originally when we looked at the project, we were within the, the C1 district, we were looking at various um, variances uh, and what would be needed for that. Uh, as it turns out, the Cleveland Board of uh, Building Zoning Appeals does not grant front yard setbacks, which we would need uh, in this district. So that has led us to um, the recommendation of the city to look to a zoning map amendment and a rezoning process. When we do that, that um, negates any issues with getting variances on height or side yards. And we are also then able to reestablish a front yard building line through this process that would um, eliminate a need for a front yard zoning variance. Um, so with this process, we would then have a fully compliant building. Um, next slide. I'm going to let Sindhu get into a little of the, the technicalities of what I've just mm -hmm. talked about, but uh, in a nutshell, um, this is how we've arrived where we are today regarding zoning. Thank you, Joanne. Um, as we were working with the city and Case Western to figure out how best to redefine this plot, um, we noticed that if we set, ask for the eight foot setback at the beginning, at the front yard, notice, please notice that most of the building is much further back from the eight foot. We're um, well in keeping with the housing across the way, which ranges from five foot to 18 feet, uh, um, and then you could take the average from that. On the on the side yards, we're in compliance working with the Greek housing to the north, as well as Howe and Fribley to the south. And then in the backyard, we redefine the backyard to allow for um, the housing at the top of the hill to be set back from the new line to allow for that height, as well as the hill building to be set back further to allow for that height to be in compliance. And if we go to the next slide, it, you can zoom in and see it a little better. So at its closest, um, our new building on Murray Hill is at eight feet right here at where the multi-purpose room is. And then everything else sets back further from that. And using the the rule that if once we set the front um, front yard setback, every foot we step back from it we can go up in height by two feet it allows the building to be fully compliant as joanne said next slide and we can show you that in section right here so you see the red line is where we set the eight foot setback and then the sloped line is the one foot step back allows for two feet of height and so the building is both buildings are compliant with the current D2 uh, restrictions. Next slide. Okay, great. Um, now we're going to talk about uh, parking. So what you see here uh, in the red is lot five. That's the current parking lot where we're going to be building these two buildings. Uh, that right now um, uh, has, I want to say, 160 spots in it. It's over here on our, on the side. Uh, we have adjacent parking lots shown in orange that have capacity for not only what we're replacing or what we're losing, but for what the required parking we need for the new building. So along the left side, you see the actual parking analysis with the number count uh, for the new two new buildings, the new 600 beds. We need 150 spots. We need one spot for each one of the kind of apartments that are street facing. Uh, and then the replacement of parking lot five, 174, gives us a total of 328 spaces needed. With the current lots, you can see in the second diagram, <clears throat> we actually have 363 spaces available 
as of today. These are spaces that the university does control. And so we have the ability to uh, not lease those and reserve those uh, for future use, which is exactly what we are intending to do. Uh, we are also intending uh, to use these available spots for um, construction parking so that, again, we are on a, a very confined uh, space within an urban district and we want to control um, those contractors so they're not taking all the street parking uh, as well as the adjacent lot parking. So uh, we're going to put those in, I'm sorry, we're going to put those in the adjacent lot parking lots. Um, and with that, I think we have, if it's available, we did do a walkthrough video. So if it can work, I'll let Sindhu kind of go. Oh. Are you able to either share the screen with Ryan? If Ryan can share his screen, he can show you the rendering, or I think the city does have our our walkthrough. Carl, I have I have it downloaded if you want me to share. If you can't do that. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. So this uh, video takes you as if you're walking across the street and looking over to the left towards the new building. And you'll see the um, undulating facade and the four apartments on the lower right, on the lower level. And then as we walk over to the right, you can see Fribley and our multi-purpose room Here's the multi-purpose room, and that is the build, part of the building that comes closest to the street. And then as you turn around the multi-purpose room, you can see how in the distance, how hall in the distance, as well as the hill building behind that's set behind the Murray Hill building. We also have presented to the Little Italy uh, review district last week. And that concludes. Thank you. Um, thank you for the very uh, thorough presentation. Um, we'll begin with feedback from the local committee. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Ray Christosik, Little Italy Redevelopment. Um, so I was not at the meeting. I'm, I'm reading from the minutes from the meeting and, and some of the points that the committee had. Uh, based on what I've heard and what I'm reading, the committee, I think, was very um, appreciative of the design of the building uh, and how it related to the street and how it connected to the neighborhood. Um, my personal thing, I think the, the group has done a nice job of addressing some of the concerns that we had in our previous meetings regarding the glazing uh, on the top floor of the front building. And I'm looking at the side here, this elevation, it looks like that, that's all glass now, which was an existing wall, which I think opens up the building not nicely to the street. Um, based on the, the minutes, it looks like the parking was a big issue for the committee and we're looking at different um, alternatives to how we one, maybe restrict the parking for people that are in the dorms that they can't get a parking permit uh, and, and, and commitments from the university at the lots that they're um, designating are going to be used for this purpose. Um, the, the one of the comments was that the, the university come up with a good construction plan where it doesn't uh, the, the, the inconvenience to the neighbors is, is minimized and also that the brick street Murray Hills, the brick is a brick road that during this, this big construction that that road will be, um, main, not maintained, but if there's any dam, we, that it's put back in the condition that it is when mm -hmm. they, they, they start, uh, the other comment was that one of the members was appreciated that they have been engaged with the um, city forester for the tree preservation on the site. Mm -hmm. um, one, one, one other thing is we are, we've, we've told the group that we need to have a community meeting um, after this meeting with landmarks 
uh, we will schedule that within the next couple of weeks. I need to talk to the councilman regarding that, but that was that was something we we um, before it comes back for final, it needs to have a community meeting. So, mm -hmm. uh, I think that I, I like think Case has done a very good job of making something fit nicely on this site. Um, that I think fits. I think that does a nice job of fitting within the context of the neighborhood. So, that's all I have. Thank you. Um, did I see that councilman Tolbert? No. Okay. So then we'll move on to question. We'll open the floor for the commission for questions and comments. Who would like to start us off? Mr. Edmund. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so the, I think the, this this is a good shot to talk about here. I think the jewel of this is really this uh, multi-purpose and community room. And I think the way, particularly if you're walking or driving south on a Delbert, the way you have this open space that's flanked by this and the other existing building that kind of greets you and uh, welcomes you and makes a transition to this this neighborhood is, is really nice, um, much better than what you have what, what's there now. Um, I also think the front doors of the kind of kind of townhouse front doors and front porches is a really nice gesture. And I think the front porch is a really important defining feature of Murray Hill. Um, but it, it visually, it seems to get lost in the architecture, uh, looking at the renderings and the and the animation. And I don't know if it's just the the coloration of the, the mm -hmm. overhang and the, the kind of it looks like you have, you know, it's a darker color that's meant to recede the front uh, first floor, which I understand, but I wonder if there's some way to visually take more advantage of the, that gesture that you're doing to the street with having those those front doors and front porches. Um, we are in the process of selecting stone for that ground floor, and um, we have the same concern about the darkness of the gray, and we're looking at medium gray stones that m might have might pull in some of the orange or pink from the brick. So it's in reality, the stones we're going to select are probably going to be much lighter than what's on the rendering. I think that would be a nice, nice. What, mm -hmm. what types of stone are you looking at? We're looking at a cold spring granite and a, a Quora stone. Um, the name of it is, they're both granites and they're in the medium range. I don't have the images here to show you currently, but. There's quite a bit of Cold Spring Granite nearby on the Cleveland Clinic campus. Too. Mm -hmm. so a, I don't know if that's an yeah. intentional tie. I mean, we did try to, we are trying to stay at a, with a domestic stone and working with local quarries, so. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Edmund. Other questions or comments from the commission? Um, I'll uh, state my comments right now. I think this is a very intriguing um, project. I just had to reorient myself with this uh, portion of the um, your campus. Um, mm -hmm. My only feedback was that I think the two bricks are fairly, you know, I, I understand and appreciate your approach to try to step back the taller portion of the building from the street so that it feels like it's more mm -hmm. four stories than five stories. Um, I don't think the color of brick and the contrast is helping you here, though, in my personal opinion, um, mm -hmm. because the bricks appear for the renderings. And I know renderings that they're, yeah. you know, they can be, they're um, an asset, but also a curse because they don't always show the real colors mm -hmm. of materials. Um, but right now it doesn't feel like it's going to um, provide that recession, you know, if the brick was of more contrast. Uh, than what you currently have it appears. If you bring us mm -hmm. the, the materials themselves, my opinion might change, you know, the mm -hmm. real materials and coloration, but um, that is the one thing that um, I would note that I, I appreciate architecturally and plan what you're doing, but um, right now it's not reading as strongly as um, I think you're intending, but it could just be the rendering. Okay. Yes, we, we are um, getting the brick samples now and putting boards together. We will also, um, in early construction, do a mock-up as well as before the mock-up's built, we're going to be building uh, larger scale brick samples so that people can see 
the bricks up against each other. And there's quite a variety of different bricks in that area as I'm you know, uh, re-familiarizing myself. So, I mean, I think there's opportunity um, to provide, you know, to meet what you're trying to do, um, relate mm -hmm. more to the context, you know, but provide that um, separation of the massing also. Okay. Thank you. Ray, did you have some additional questions or comments? I just wanted to comment. I think the community space that is on the other end of this, this rendering. I think it's real, and I agree with Mr. Edmonds, I think it's really nice and I think it'll work nicely with the uh, wing hall, which the university renovated last year. Um, and, I, and I think that was very well done and I, it's nice to drive by there and see people eating in the glass instead of this brick facade that we saw for so many years. So I, I agree with him. I think that plot, that's gonna create a nice little plaza area that um, it'll be a nice entrance way to the neighborhood. So mm -hmm. that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Other questions or comments from the commission? Mr. Benazi, you're, are you still here with us? Do you have any questions or comments? Thank you, Madam Chair. You always know I'll have comments. <laughs> no, I've been um, keeping everyone in the office at bay. I would just <laughs> echo your thing. I think it's a fantastic project that kind of relates to the context very well. You know, it's not, you took a lot, you know, from your first slide, right? You took inspiration from the context, both in materiality and your formal conditions. But I would agree with uh, the chair in that kind of that brick color in the back is not providing you the contrast that I think you want to let that back building recede. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, Little Italy is a very growing community. Um, we know that here on the commission uh, from past things. Um, mm -hmm. and I think exploring what's new and up and coming in the um, community and also what is present can kind of inform what that back material could be to kind of let this front really express itself. Right, because mm -hmm. right now I really just want to read like the beautiful kind of articulating brick and this beautiful glass box. But then I have this orange band at the top. That I'm like, oh, what are you back there? Mm -hmm. um, and some, and I feel like maybe something a very neutral kind of brick color could let that recede. Um, but I think this is fantastic. I drive by that time all the time. From that, oh, I'm all turned around when I'm coming from Cleveland Heights to Little Italy. Um, I always mm -hmm. drive down this road. Uh, so it'll be a very exciting addition to that part of town. Thank you, Mr. Bernazzi. Thanks. Oh. Didn't mean to cut you off, but uh, did you have anything further? No, um, usually I'd say less, you know, not much to comment on if it's a great project. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Thank Bernazzi. You. Other questions or comments from the commission? Not seeing any. Does the applicant, since this is a um, conceptual re uh, review, will not be voting? Um, do you feel like you've received enough feedback from the commission to continue your development? If we do, yep. Thank you. Okay. Yes, thank you. Appreciate the time. Thank you. We look forward to seeing your project progress and you coming back this uh, to present to us in the near future. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Bye. That concludes our concept plan reviews. We'll move on to um, our landmark our nominations. Mr. Pettit or Mr. Brenges, would you like to tell us about the nomination? Thank you, Madam Chair. Happy to present the Cleveland Landmark nomination for Advent Evangelical Lutheran Church, located at 15309 Harvard Avenue. You can see here just between East 153rd and East 154th Street on in Ward 1. Hopefully the councilman will return. He's popped in and out throughout uh, the meeting. Um, Reverend Alan G. Youngblood was the pastor who started this congregation, he was ordained in Philadelphia and he organized to organize and was the pastor of two other Lutheran churches uh, prior to coming to Cleveland to establish 
this congregation. Uh, the first services were held in the Masonic Temple of York Masons on Kinsman Road. That building still stands as well with nine members. This is an interesting period of time in uh, the Lutheran Church um, as in June of 1961, there was a merger of four different synods into what became the Lutheran Church in America. And it created all these different changes and they became, the LCA became the largest Lutheran denomination in America at that time. Um, again, and then in 1988, there was another merger with two other synods to form what is now the ELCA, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America. And that still is the largest Lutheran denomination of 40, uh, but there are this, then there is the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, and then the uh, Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod as well. Those are your big three in, this, in the country right now. The church moved into the property uh, of a former carryout liquor store in 1962. Uh, it, previously, it had been a fruit stand, and I saw one picture where they were selling Christmas trees there. And uh, this was purchased by the Home Mission Board of the Ohio Synod. And the first service was held on April 1st, 1962 uh, on this property. So we are at 60 years. and. We are only a week away from that anniversary of that first service. And then the church was officially organized on June 10th, 1962 as well. They converted the building to, for church use uh, to make it more appealing to the neighborhood. And that is what it looked like until they decided to start working on plans for the new church. The Ohio Synod of the Lutheran Church in America was formed in 1962, and it had uh, a number of congregations, not only just from Ohio, but there was some from Pennsylvania as well. And Advent Evangelical Lutheran Church was the first congregation to be received into this new synod uh, on September 14th, 1962. So this is a huge transition, and this brand new congregation was the first to be into the new synod at that time. And that is a photo of the congregation from that period. So a new church was being uh, worked on um, from the making of Cleveland's Black Suburb, which was done by the uh, Cleveland Restoration Society. It's a mid-century designed, influenced by Usonian architecture, and it has a screen substyle that's more likely seen on a commercial building rather than on an uh, evangelical building. And they employed architects at Whitley and Whitley Inc. as their architects for the project. Um, now, I could talk a little bit more about Whitley and Whitley, but I figured I would turn this over to the expert on Whitley Whitley, and I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Scott Whitley of Whitley Whitley uh, to talk about his family and um, the architecture. Thank you, thank you, Carl. Uh, first of all, let me just thank you guys for the opportunity to tell you a little bit about our story and uh, tell you why the connection between Whitley and Whitley, I believe, and uh, Advent Lutheran Church is important to its designation. Um, first of all, I think uh, in terms of the connection between Whitley and Whitley and Advent Lutheran Church being important to its designation, as I was reading, it seems like the one of the criteria for designation is the quality of the architects who worked on the project and the quality of their architects and whether or not they were master builders or not. So uh, my goal is to tell you, in my mind, there's no doubt uh, that my father, my uncle, and uh, my aunt are master architects. I don't know how you get the official designation of being master architects, but I'm hoping through their body of work, uh, their design excellence, that you will agree that they too are uh, master architects. So this first slide, I, I'd just like to introduce you to the founding principles. Uh, my father, William Whitley, is the 
one standing up with the white shirt. Uh, next to him is his twin brother, James Whitley, and beside James is their sister, Joyce Whitley. And what is unique, and their, their story is really unique, even taking this time to do a little bit of research. I mean, uh, when you grow up with these people, you kind of take things for granted. And uh, when you grow older, and uh, Carl, Colt, Carl, Carl called me and asked me to give him some information, I was able to start looking into information. And you start to really find out how extraordinary uh, they really are and how much respect they have in the field and what other people say about them. Uh, so this first slide, you know, I just want to show you who they are and tell you when they first started in the early 60s, their main focus was urban renewal, rehabilitating communities. Uh, they later went on to uh, a great deal of success, really. Uh, and they have done projects. You know, I usually tell people now we really don't have a niche. I don't know if that's for better or for worse, but it is what it is. Uh, throughout the years, we have done things. We've we kind of used to follow government money. Uh, in the early 70s, urban planning was big. Uh, there was money being funded in urban planning. That's where they probably got their first successes. Uh, then it went on. It has gone on from housing. It's gone on to schools. Uh, you know, right now we're, we're we're doing a lot of work in the private sector. So I tell people we have a wide portfolio of work that ranges from small projects to large projects. Oh. Uh, could you go back one slide? Oops, oops, oops. Oh, you can go to the next slide. Oh, uh, okay. We'll, we'll go with the slide. Um, I had them out of order, but okay. Um, now, this slide is, I want to tell you a little bit about each of, uh, each of the individuals. Um, my father and James, twins, did everything together. Born in this, from the same womb, went to the same schools all the way through college, uh, went to the Air Force together, played football at Kent State together, went on, got a career in architecture for 50 years. They're the closest human beings I've ever seen in my entire life. That being said, Bob Madison probably has the distinction of being the first registered architect in the uh, state of Ohio, but I have to believe they are second and third, but they're certainly, I have to give them a first for being the first twin African American architects in the state of Ohio. Uh, being that the, the firm is, was established in 1963, we also have to have the distinction of being one of the oldest firms uh, still practicing in the state of Ohio. Uh, and then there's Joyce. Joyce has the distinction of being, if not the first African American. Uh, woman and uh, city planner and urban uh, planner. Uh, she's certainly also one of the first. Uh, she graduated from the University of Chicago. And in 63, she had to be, you know, pretty much one of the first African American women in that field. Uh, she's worked on huge projects. Uh, she was a uh, chief planning advisor for model cities uh, administration. And she also served on Cleveland's public, uh, Cleveland's planning commission. And then finally, me. I did not put myself in this presentation to compare myself or try to get any of the accolades that they have received and deserve. But I did put myself in the, the pictures because when you start seeing a lot of these black and white pictures, it, you kind of get the impression that this is past history. And I just wanted uh, everyone to know that Whitley Whitley still is alive and well. Next slide, please. Now getting to the significance and the connection between uh, Whitley and Whitley and Amphit Lutheran Church. Uh, this project, particularly to me, and especially to James Whitley, has a, a, a dear place in our hearts and in the history of Whitley and Whitley. Advent Lutheran Church, I think we've heard about its significance in the community, but as it goes down in Whitley Whitley's history, it is the first project that Whitley Whitley ever did. And uh, if you ever talk to James, uh, and I heard him answer the question a million times, uh, a lot of times people talk to him and ask him what was the first project he ever worked on or he ever did as Whitley and Whitley, and it was always 
Lutheran Advent Church. Uh, and to that extent, if there were no Lutheran Advent Church, there may not have been uh, Whitley and Whitley. Without that opportunity, James may have sought a uh, job in the private sector. And uh, with that being said, I may not be an architect to this day. So the fact that the church gave them the opportunity, if you can imagine two young, very young, but determined and confident African-American architects back in either the late 60s or the early 70s, uh, seeking an opportunity, if you can only imagine how much of a, a hill that must have been to climb. Uh, and I know firsthand because uh, it's still a hard uh, hill to climb, so I can only imagine what it was like for them uh, back in those early days. But this project, they lived in the community, they lived in the Lee Harvard area, uh, they were able to go to their community and their community uh, gave them their first opportunity. And with that opportunity, they allowed uh, James to take a leap of faith and ultimately uh, catapulted us into future success. Next slide, please. Okay, and then what I wanted to do on this slide, you know, I know this uh, is mainly for the designation of uh, uh, of, of uh, for the Advent Lutheran Church, but uh, going back to the quality of the architects and the quality of their work, I wanted to go through just uh, probably the more high profile, um, more recognizable projects that they worked on uh, in uh, Cleveland. And uh, some of these, they were the architect of record, some of them, they were associate architects. Um, but uh, these were some of the ones that are the high profile. I'll start off with the, the bottom right and the Wallstein Center. Uh, William Whitley is the architect of record uh, for the Wallstein Center. We were a joint venture with probably Dalton and Dalton at the time, but they were engineering. We were responsible uh, for the architecture of the building. Uh, going up is the Tower City Avenue project. Uh, that was a project I worked on uh, shortly after I graduated. This was a, a joint venture, or a, uh, we were probably the associate architects uh, with Canon Design, but we were responsible for all the interior um, floors, rails, storefronts, and we also were responsible for the substation, the RTA substation on the project. Uh, CSU uh, Clock Tower, uh, I, I like this one because it's, it's kind of iconic in that I always see it. It's it wasn't our one of our biggest projects, but it's a recognizable project. If you're ever in that area, if you're ever on that campus, uh, you you just cannot uh, miss that. Uh, what's interesting is its connection. It was more than just the um, the clock tower, but that is what was uh, mainly visible. And then finally, Jacobs Field. This was probably one of uh, Joyce's. Uh, final later projects in her career as an urban planner. And this is a project she worked in uh, on the planning stages and actually received an award, a Progressive Architecture Award for this project. And this was actually our second Progressive Architecture Award. So going down the selected list, I've named a few, but I did want to mention the John F. Kennedy um, High School Recreation Center. And, I, and they were most proud of that project probably because I think they got their highest recognition nationally off that project. And they won their first Progressive Architecture Award doing that project. And they, and they won that at a, at a fairly young age. Uh, that was at the time they considered the Oscars of the profession. It was a national award. Every architect in the city uh, or every architect in the country, if not international, read Progressive Architectures design yearly design awards and who won and usually the, the biggest architectures of across the country who receives these awards so i wanted to point that out and uh, some of the other projects uh the architectural record of uh cleveland state fashion museum and we've done work for the cleveland clinic next slide please and then in honor of uh national women's uh, month you know, I, I just want to take a little bit of time to talk about Joyce Whitley. 
Joyce is the other half of Whitley and Whitley. Whitley and Whitley, uh, the, the official name is Whitley Whitley Architects and Planners. And Joyce was the planning half of Whitley and Whitley. And she was, ex she's an extremely unique woman and, and a pioneer for not only women in uh, urban design, but also women in general uh, back in the 70s. Uh, what was interesting about her is that uh, if you ever talk to my father or James, they will tell you she played a significant role in getting projects in the early days for Whitley and Whitley. And their strategy was kind of Joyce would get the projects and uh, do the planning. And then once the project got funding, they were on the, uh, the, the bottom floor to be able to receive the architecture. So she was a uh, 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 she was a, a woman ahead of her time, uh, and uh, she was an extremely unique woman. Next slide, please. And then finally, just some notable achievements. Uh, and this is just kind of give you just our family, what type of family uh, we are. And, uh, you know, I always joke with my wife that her family, I think, is more left or right side of brain. We are more, our family's more left side of brain. Uh, we tend to be on the creative side. Uh, but uh, some of their notable achievements, they won many awards. If you saw the, the first uh, slide, there were a number of awards that were behind them. Uh, like I said earlier, some of their more impressive, what they were most impressed with was the Progressive Architecture Awards. Uh, they won uh, Architect Society of Ohio Honor Awards design and, and, and excellence in masonry, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, my father was uh, head of the Cleveland Housing Division Operation Push during the mid 70s. James served as the president of the Urban League. I don't have the exact date, but I'm sure it was in the 70s. He was president. Um, we were named the Whitley Family of the Year in 72. Both, like I said, they are Renaissance people. They were both uh, uh, architects as well as inventors, and they hold patents. Joyce became a playwright, I think, when um, in her, later in her career, and uh, not as much funding was coming from the government. Joyce became a playwright and wrote a play, Dreams of Callahan. Uh, and um, Joyce was actually chief plan for the United States Department of Housing, Urban and Development. And, in the late 60s. And then finally, just to throw a little bit of Hollywood in there, I think everybody likes a little bit of Hollywood. Uh, my sister, she just won a 2022 Image Award, uh, her and Sherry Shepard for uh, this podcast. But that, I, what I was trying to do is really try to show the connection, show that they are very unique individuals. I hope you can see that they're level of architecture that they practice throughout the years in a field that is uh, dominated uh, uh, by people of uh, that are not of color. Uh, they, they've, uh, they're, they're, even for me, there's some large uh, shoes to fill. And uh, with that, I will give the presentation back to Carl. Thank you, Scott. And uh, just want to let you know, I reached out to the APA, uh, American Planner Association, in Chicago yesterday, and I believe they are investigating a little bit more on Joyce's legacy as well. So hopefully uh, this will open up some more opportunities to tell her story in the future as well. Oh, definitely. That would be wonderful. So in my uh, visit to the church, I um, have that rare occasion to find working drawings, not the final ones. And uh, the church was originally supposed to have an addition uh, later on. So we have the original plans and this. It was neat seeing the working drawings from 1964. Um, you can see here all the notes they're taking throughout this process. And then um, the groundbreaking, July 7th, 1965. And then we had the plans that were finally submitted to uh, the planning commission or to the uh, building department. Uh, these were with the uh, city council archivist. Just run a few of these. And 
And we are the first service was on December 12th, 1965. And looking at the current conditions. It's here. It maintains its integrity. Our interior shots. This has a unique uh, style of glass. This is Harlequin or diamond rolled glass. Uh, unfortunately, this type of glass is no longer in production, and they have recently had uh, some vandalism, which damaged some of it. Uh, I've been in contact with uh, the pastor, and I've also been in contact with uh, the council president, Fred Baker, Baker who um, tried to find options for them, and I'm sure we'll have more discussions later on. And then some of the other areas of the church. But one thing we can't forget is it's not just about the building, it's about the people that in the congregation that make the building, the, the residents of the area, and they're the ones that give this building life and continue to bring it on. And they were gracious enough to share some of their photographs of events that are going on and that how it lives and breathes throughout. The significance we at, on our landmarks nomination form, we have 10 check boxes and we were able to identify at least seven. And based upon its history, its connection to the architects and everything combined, I think it checks off another box and something that we may want to investigate a little bit more. And this may be eligible for the National Register of Historic Places as well. And that's something that we will probably look to in the future. Again, um, again, in speaking with uh, the council president, um, this will need to go. He wants to engage the congregation in this and make sure and I've spoken with him and I'm going to make arrangements to go out and speak to this with them because we'd like to have their full blessing. But at this time, I'd like to actually introduce uh, Pastor Killings from Advent Evangelical Lutheran Church and have him give some comments at this time. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Carl. Um, I'm Reverend Dr. Leonard Killings, and I've worked in ministry at several world-class hospitals in the Cleveland area. However, my greatest crown of vocational satisfaction is serving the membership and the community of the Advent Church in the Lee Harvard area of Ward 1. Joseph Jones was councilman when I began in 2001. Many of my politically active members supported all of his campaigns, as well as supported voter education and voter participation in the community. Advent members are civic minded. One Advent member was a four term city councilman, another a four term state representative, another a director of Urban League. Over the past 20 years at Advent, I have heard narratives and witnessed a membership dedicated to the community. During Advent 60 years, members consisted of Army, Navy, Marine, and Air Force veterans, a Tuskegee Airmen, police officers, local postal workers, and supervisors, Cleveland car factory and steel mill workers, educators, supervisors, school custodians, principals, teachers, and a band director, RTA workers and supervisors, social workers, nurses, lawyers, a dentist, a Tri-C vocational counselor and a Tri-C jazz legend of the year, along with other musicians and a NASA physicist and later NASA EEO officer. I noted earlier that the Advent building, as noted earlier, the Advent building is an example of one of the local early springboards into the pool of architectural success that the Whitney and Whitley company can reflect back on as they now look down from more loftier diving boards and continue to plunge into our stand out astoundingly deeper pools of architectural achievement, notoriety, prosperity, and creativity. Our membership, Scott may not uh, be aware of, included uh, James Whitley Jr. as he joined in March of 1964, according to our records through confirmation and baptized Kent Whitley in October of 1964. And I am pleased to be here today with Scott Whitley to witness this nomination and to address 
the Cleveland Landmark Commission and to attest to this presentation by Carl and Scott. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I appreciate that. I, I did, now that you mentioned it, I do remember that uh, Kent was uh, baptized there and uh, that James did uh, join the church. Thank you, Pastor Killings. Uh, Madam Chair, we have Councilman Joe Jones with us. Welcome, Councilman. Would you like to say a few words? Yes, um, I would. Um, let's see, I, I don't know if you guys can see me. Um, um, you know, I was really, I'm really impressed with um, the, the actual um, presentation and um, uh, equally impressed with um, with the architects and planners uh, that planned the church, uh, uh, their history, um, uh, given the fact that this church uh, launched um, uh, in our community uh, civic engagement, uh, one of the first uh, Lutheran churches in our community, uh, ever in our community, we don't have any others. And um, just the, the historical significance of, of how um, the architecture, if it wasn't for them, Putting this particular church, their first uh, piece together, how it went on to launch uh, their entire history of all of the various different um, um, architectural designs that uh, that actually not only in our neighborhood with the John F. Kennedy High School, but also with the John F. Kennedy Recreational Facility. Uh, in addition to that, um, uh, their impact on the greater Cleveland area and um, and the world. Um, so this is really significant. Um, I 110% you know, support it. Avon Lutheran Church is a staple in our neighborhood, and certainly uh, it um, has has been is at that level elevated to to get all the considerations of the committee. Um, I'm 110% for it. Uh, they have a a wonderful pastor, Mr. Killings, uh, and his organization uh, has been nothing but positive contributions to our community. Uh, and I'm so appreciative to have the honor and the opportunity uh, to be their councilman. So it, it brings me great pleasure to support this and as well as to endorse this. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Mr. Brendis, is there any additional items for our presentation or should we move on to council, uh, commission feedback? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I am finished at this time. Excellent. Well, thank you for such a thoughtful presentation and you know, the addition of the history on the architect. Um, it's an amazing uh, history to both the firm and related to this building. Um, I, I do support the nomination personally because I think it's a, uh, it's, it is a great uh, demonstration of you know, uh, Cleveland history. Are there additional questions or comments from the commission? I know Mr. Edmund uh, unfortunately had to leave, but he did put his comments in the chat saying that this is an excellent building with an important uh, social history and he supports the nomination also. Feedback from other commission members? Mr. Bonazzi? It's been strong in a long meeting. No, I would absolutely support this nomination with such a rich history. As soon as I was scrolling through and I saw the name Whitley and Whitley, I, I absolutely knew what my position on this project would be. Um, so, you know, beyond the contributions to the community, just the contributions to like, you know, the architectural profession that your family has given and kind of the benchmarks that have been set are just beyond recognition. So I think, you know, being the first project and having that kind of, you know, there's always only one first. And that is absolutely something we're saving. So I'd be more than supportive and um, very excited about this coming forward to the commission. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Benazzi. Other questions or comments from the commission? Any additional questions or comments or motion? Of, would someone like to put forward a motion? Mr. Dreyer? Uh, yes, I, I'm uh, happy to make the motion to nominate this. Uh, as a 
Okay, so thank you for that motion. Do we have a second? I'll second that motion. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Any further discussion? All right, Mr. Pettit, please call roll and announce the results. Ms. Anderson. Yes. Mr. Bonazzi. Yes. Mr. Dreyer. Yes. Mr. Tarasic. Yes. Ms. Trott. Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Excellent. Well, we look forward to um, in you know support the continuation of this process for nomination. Thank you very much. Thank you. That concludes our landmark nominations. We'll move on to administrative reports. I just have a couple of items. Uh, I'm really happy to report that city council and the finance department have given us a full-time employee uh, and we'll be posting those jobs in, in the very near future. Uh, sorry, it's been a long meeting. Uh, the other item I've already mentioned, and that is the BZA overturned our decision on the uh, the Hovis House on West 32nd Street. Um, they determined that we were, in fact, arbitrary and capricious. Uh, the, the one one item that ought to be mentioned is that the councilman was there to support the applicant. And he also indicated that he may be introducing legislation to take the review of solar panels out of our code. And I'm a little disturbed by that potential. Uh, it's not unlike the, the potential removal of clay tile roofs. Uh, you know, I think we showed today that we can approve solar panel applications in certain circumstances. And I think that should continue to be our policy. I think we do have to, we do have to, um, you know, further refine our, our standards for solar panels, I think, but, but I, I don't think they should just be removed from our consideration because they do impact, you know, the architecture of a building, you know, and then, and I think we can find a middle ground where we can support the technology and, and, and find ways to make uh, solar, uh, appropriate for historic buildings. That's all. Um, other than that, I have nothing else unless I'm forgetting something, Carl, uh, or if you guys have any questions. The new bridge works site visit, it was rescheduled till 3 PM next Tuesday. For those of you who did not visit, uh, they are, since their original plan did not receive the funding they were requesting they are now looking to demolish not only the 1960s building but now the art deco building so they are looking at the 1941 art deco garage so 3 p.m next tuesday i am personally not going to schedule this so if you want to go out and do the walkthrough on your own they will be out there also i got a call from uh, kluba metro parks yesterday um, apparently during their excavations for their new dock in the Cleveland Center National Register Historic District, uh, they found a time capsule that was placed there not too long ago, but there was a rock that was placed over the top of it that somehow got moved and it was not where it was supposed to be or the rock was not where it was supposed to be. So what they have done are they are taking this new they're taking the time capsule and reburying it by the rock so that in the future it can be found where it's supposed to be. So because they have dug out an entire canal for a new docking slip, I believe, out over there. Thank you. Thanks, Carl. Thanks, Don. Um I think it's interesting and we should have more conversation on um, solar panels because I think and you know, like we said, it was not the, the installation of the solar panels. It was the roofing material that 
you know, we at that time or half of the commission had objection to. Um, and since it was a even number, it failed by default, correct? It was a split decision on the roofing. Um, Actually, actually, it was a unanimous vote. Uh, oh, was we, it? we voted to deny it because the applicant wouldn't table the project. He asked us to, to take action so that he could appeal our decision so that it was it was, in fact, a unanimous decision. But I think we were kind of forced into into that. We, we couldn't separate out the roof from the solar panels. I think we could have worked with him and come up with a better solution, but uh, that's that's not where we ended up. Sure. Well, I think uh, it would, as this continues you know, to move forward, keep us as you always do informed so that we can, you know, it would be sad if they took that out also, just like the clay tiles. Has that moved forward to approval, the removal of the clay tile roofs from over in our yeah. jurisdiction? It has not. Uh, okay. We we had a discussion with the councilman. It was I don't think it was ever his intention to proceed with it. He just wanted to. I think he just wanted to make a point, and he I think he made his point, and uh, so I I think I don't know the, the actual status of that legislation, but I think his intent was to withdraw it eventually. Uh, we should make sure that that does happen. Um, and and I think we should have further discussions with Councilman McCormick uh, before something gets introduced, uh, just so he understands our position. I would agree with that. I would agree with that. Okay. Anything else for uh, from the rest of the commission for updates? No. Then we will be. All right. Then we are adjourned, and we'll see everyone in two weeks. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Take care. Thank you.